It's a very, very high tech we've got going on. Yeah, here. I won't use my laptop for predictions. Yeah. I'll have another I'll have another bag for predictions. What the okay. what? <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna make his yeah, life. Yeah, I forgot. I'm gonna no, that's no, fine. When we get to the <laughs> the array example, there's a projection spot and an arts projections one thing installed. Uh Oh, yeah. I mean, as long as, so just, uh, just get, uh, invite Marsha uh, to this thing yeah. and then screen share on your laptop. That's oh, okay, yeah, but that I don't have anything to show. You don't? I mean, I can go to the issues. I wanted to trace the message and show that. Well, no, but that, that's I mean, that, fine. That's as long as yeah, they can yeah, see what you're doing, okay. you know, they'll be able to see the same thing that people hear say. Yeah. That's the important thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that should be did you get that part? Okay. So let me. And invite Harshita in. <laughs> Wait, where's the invite link? Yeah, it's just up top. Yeah. There. Okay, everything seems to be working. <laughs> there we go. We'll, we'll play on the invite. Okay. Yeah, I'll switch it up to screen share and switch back to your slides. And then <laughs> so I'm on a different okay. little bit just to make sure it's fine. And then if you guys have any questions, yeah. I'll just be over in PPL and I'll be online. Okay. So. okay. We're good. Oh, this was taken out of full screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah. When you screen share, you should be able to screen share a specific application. So. Yes. Oh, is it possible to screen share the whole? Yeah, yeah, you can also screen share the whole desktop. Desktop, OK, yeah, yeah that's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah because we have both the slides out okay. of the terminal. Yeah, then you should definitely do that. And probably you should also increase the size of the slide. Oh, jeez. Oh, that's, that's a bad idea. Well, just um, when I switch it, you won't, be, you won't have this open because someone's doing it. No, OK. Yeah, so it should be fine. <laughs> So Phil, how do you want to handle the projection yeah. slides? Yeah. Um, you need a that's how was it? So Harshita is going to be in the uh, hangout, so she can. She's covering yeah. that whole segment. Yeah. Want, even that. Well, there's yeah. a section right. really early on. Projections, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but there's like a projection yeah. spot, like right, like in probably like ten slides or so. Is what I'm saying. There's like a one-off one. But that's okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the load balancing is all harsh it is, right? Yeah, so. Oh, okay, so we're going to need to potentially get a congressman. Can you switch over to the drone on the past just so I can see yep. how the board is? Yeah, we definitely increase the size of that, too. Oh, yeah, crap. I there we go. Um, I haven't been analyzing. Is that good? No, yeah, it's, yeah, there's this lag. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that's right. It's broadcast like yeah. 30, 40 seconds by. Yeah, I want to look at the. It's still like the hangout, so I can keep showing this good Yeah. But you probably, I assume, want to zoom this. Well, this might be a different question. Oh, you know, that's a Twitter over it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it should be at the top. So how we, you, yeah. can, you can still read the slides. Yeah, I guess. Apparently, yeah, but the different kinds of codes are very distinct and you have all patterns. Yeah, you know what code you're using. This is the one. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, there. <laughs> there we go. Like, I don't think okay. I'm going to go to the trouble of reading. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's a little bit <laughs> messy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's much, much better than the other feed. Yeah, yeah, the other feed is completely upgraded. Yeah, sure. So this is way better. OK. okay. Uh, so I think it's yours from here. <laughs> so do you want well, Let's get the mic on, and then I'll turn it back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's off right now, so. And that's the small end. I think this is the fewest students that they got here. Yeah, I heard uh, at one point there was like 30 something. I think our peak was like 26 people. Yeah, 26 people. Then we had a few staff, like four staff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the. Yeah, that's the trick for the peak. students and college. Like, I think eight people or nine people. I'm like, I'm a local entry. Yeah. Also, if you use the back tracing mode, that's 
How many postdocs? Right now, none. Fifteen students. Are they Fifteen students. Well, Eric, it's only there. It's sort of. Yeah. Fifteen graduates. Yes. Right now we're we're short ended. Yeah. There's way more work to do. In yeah. Yeah. We're we're we're, we're recruiting new graduate students for the next year. Is there a PPL hazing process that they go through? Or? Um, like, you know, teaching sharp tutorials in their first semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's about the extent of it. It was a pretty interesting process of understanding some of the really old, fun comic of code in the source tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, assigning bug fixes in some of the uglier bits of our code base. We gave you that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Eric. Eric's in his second year, but he just joined the group this term, so. so you can comment on the initiation, I guess. That's straight out of Asimov. What? In in uh, the Foundation trilogy. What the go go the back and fix stuff? The Foundationalists sort of make their mark by going to some region of the diagram that's not yeah. well and worked out and adding a little piece to it. Yeah. Yeah. What exactly about foundation? I'm sorry? What exactly you said about foundation too much? The, the foundationalists make their mark by taking a piece of the, um, the projected history diagram that's not been well studied and um, defining it as far as what the probabilities are of various. <laughs> That's the name. Let's give you a picture. Yeah. Yeah. But it has that character. Yeah. Yeah. Dive into a, a bug. Here's 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 Here's a bug. Here's a bug. Here's a bug. Here's a and an excuse to dive in. Yeah, looking back at the undergrad, I actually used MS2 for a summer project. Um, an interesting experience. MS3 is all child, but not right? Mm -hmm. It's all simple. Okay. With, yeah. with uh, an auto generated mm -hmm. Python API. Okay. So you can write your models in Python. Okay. But the yeah. actual implementations in C. Yeah, it's writing and taking scripts to try it. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. Another two minutes and then we'll back on. So when did actually have to arrive? Yes. She's in my office. Yeah, I know the painter is in the room. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I got my boy pass. I'm going to point out here. I don't know if I can print it. I don't know if I can print it. I didn't have a scratch. It's okay. You have a, you have a, you're already working then? You're good. That's why I did early first. Are you going to fly us in here? What? Are you flying to Champagne? No, we're flying from uh, Midway. And we got just got to drop that tire back on. Yeah, I was gonna say if you fly from here, you so can still off like you know a half hour before scheduled departure. You'll okay. have your boarding pass printed out already. Yeah. And just you know say hi, are you so and so as a candidate? They made it to you. Yeah. I've had that happen. They, they sort of know you personally. No, it wasn't that they knew yeah, me. It was that I was the only person who had to already come through. I've gotten there too early before, and TSA wasn't even there. Then they were open yet. So I just had to wait to lobby and then they were open. Oh, the TSA agents weren't working. They just weren't there. So you could go. There are only the departing flights from here from like 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then like 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Oh, so the airport sort of goes. So I can just fly. Yeah, so the so half the airport closes down in the middle of the day. So this whole thing is safe. Yeah. So if you go into the terminal directory, 
And then there's just like the one police officer sitting there making sure no one comes or goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. But the dust lash. Charmless bus. Alright, so let's just for my education. Eric, is he building on his own machine? Uh, right, right. So I'm declaring. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I want to trace the where he's going to go. And then you want to parallelize the name. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
or will be to the same processor. It's possible that the small message gets delivered first to the other object before the big fat message, because it just took a little longer, and that's okay. Right. Whereas in the eye, we require a certain ordering between, because they're going to the same rank, let's mm -hmm. say, that they. Yeah. So those, are the, those are the two easiest to explain issues. Mm -hmm. Can you ask for particular words? Like, if you want mm -hmm. the dependence among, like, in particular, where this bites you in time warp systems is you never want the role of the anti message being the positive message, oh. which which in certain implementations of NPI is really possible. Mm -hmm. So, so you got this anti message going, I can't find the positive message to go after and cancel. And it's because the positive message hasn't fit. Was that because this one is going direct and the other is going from some other rank, or so, no? It was coming from a uh, different, but it was coming from the same rank, so rank to rank. But it was just the order in which. So, so when we implement it, we we, we do a um, uh, MPI receives on any source any tag. Okay, and they were on different tags, so they could be received. And they're on different tags. So, but because it's any source, any tag, if you get the end, so it was just sort of luck of the draw. So I've seen this with the SGI implementation of MPI, that it, it will 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 allow an out of order <coughs> message. But if I use right. image, <coughs> image any source, any tag it says no. Um, yeah, that, I think that might mean. actually be a bug in SGI's MPI. I'm pretty sure it is. Well, because it's not specified. No, no, the thing is, if two different messages from a given source can match or receive, they have to be matched in the order of the sender. Send them. Yeah. Uh, maybe they took it. Well, yeah, from different senders. If it's different senders, there is no order. Yeah. In this case, this case has to be the same. This would happen to the same one. But I've seen, I saw this in the SGI implementation on one of the uh, army machines. So I just said, yeah, where's MPitch? So I always tell users, fill with MPitch. Do not use OpenMPI and Vapage or in, um, any other version. Just always use it. Use it. Yeah, but and we've got good success with that. Charm allows. So Charm imposes no inherent ordering among messages. And uh, yeah, and then you can do things with Threads or a construct called SDAG that we'll discuss a little later to enforce the sequencing inside the recipient objects. Oh, so that, that of course is the ordering of the execution of the events. Not, not a rival time, so. so, I mean, the, what will happen is the, the dependent event may arrive first and then we'll just buffer it until the event oh, okay. on arrives. So, in your case, You may have to programmatically clear that because you're only going to send the anti undo message when there's a rollback. Correct. Which is not the normal execution stream. Correct. And so I don't think that's the that Okay. So it's mm -hmm. easy. I, I can think of a way to do it. But we'll, we can talk about it offline. We should probably resume, I think. We're going to take like 15 minutes. Okay. Pause, so. So I'll go over briefly about load balancing in general. Um, so let's say, we, I mean, in a dynamic scenario, we know load balancing is quite useful and all that. Let's look at a static scenario where the domain load doesn't change over time. But if it's an irregular application, when the user decomposes the domain, it could ha so happen that certain domains have a larger load compared to other ones. So what, what do you do? The programmer will have to explicitly say how to map these domains onto the processes. But we don't want to burden the programmers with taking care of mapping the domains depending on the data set or you know, the size at which you're running, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a static case. The, the other case is dynamic case where many applications are becoming more adaptive in the sense that they're using algorithms which do adaptive refinement. So all of a sudden, you may have a large increase in the load. You know, you spawned many more tasks, and then there could be a load imbalance due to that. So 
and and um, such an example as AMR adaptive mesh refinement. The other case is when there is a gradual change of load. Let's say in molecular dynamic simulation, the atoms move from one region to another region, or in cosmology, the particles move from one one char or object to another char. So this also introduces load balance and load imbalance during runtime. So that is the dynamic case. So the best way to uh, and what is wrong with load imbalance? So the thing is, <clears throat> the the scalability or performance is limited by the most overloaded processor. It doesn't matter who are um, you know very less loaded or things like that or very close to average load. But if some processor is ten times more than the average load, um, then that is going to determine what is the time step or what is the performance of the application. That's why we want to make sure that the load is balanced among the processors so we don't have scalability problems in the future. And as we increase the, as we go to larger and larger scales, uh, the chance that just one processor is going to become much more overloaded than others is going to increase. So that's why it becomes even more critical to um, to improve the load ba load imbalance problem uh, when we go to larger scale. And we are essentially wasting resources, right? Like if some of the processes are just sitting idle doing nothing, then it's a wastage of resources also. So in, in turn, the uh, over decomposition along with migratability empowers the runtime system to do all these tasks of load balance. So the runtime system is going to okay, the runtime system is going to monitor the application and whenever it notices that uh, there is a significant load imbalance there, then it, it, it identifies that there is a load imbalance and so it can trigger the load balancing process. And the load uh, load balancer will get all the load statistics which is being collected automatically by the runtime system and do the necessary load balancing that is required. Because we have over decomposition, it can, mi it can migrate some of the uh, tasks from the overloaded process to the underloaded ones. So that's the essential idea of load balancing. Um, it's supposed to be a video, uh, basically. But here uh, it's a Brazilian weather code simulation. <coughs> This was the work done by Eduardo and Celso Mendes uh, with a collaboration with Brazilian University. So here what we are seeing is this is the domain that we are looking at. And this is the storm that's coming in. It's a nice um, animation, in fact, we could have watched it. So if we just decompose this normally, let's say, among four processors, then the, the region or the domain that's containing the storm has the most work. That's the most overloaded processor. And as the storm moves from, and is, the storm is not stuck at one place, right? It moves from one domain to another domain. And as it is moving from one region to another region, another domain is going to get overloaded. So this is a very dynamic um, application which requires frequent monitoring and frequent load balancing to ensure good performance. So this is, um, this is, um, 64. 64, uh, yeah, 64 processes on a grid, and um, color coding shows how much of a load is there on each process. Red means there's a high load there, and you know, blue means there's very less load there. So wherever the storm is moving, those processes are going to get much more overloaded than the others. So let's look at um, first over decomposition in this case. The left case is when you have four processes and the domain is exactly divided into four. That's the usual case in MPI. <coughs> so here, there is no scope of any load balancing or, um, you know, yeah, balancing the load. So when a, wherever the storm is set, whichever domain the storm is set, that process is going to be much more overloaded. In over decomposition, we we'll further div divide this domain into many more work and data units than the execution unit. So here, you, let's say you have only four, four, four processors. Uh, we can further divide this four um, domains into another four and the total 16 over decomposed domains map on four processors. So each will, if they are evenly loaded, they'll probably get four domains per 
score. So this is a study that was um, that was done. So the idea of moving from uh, the, the actually the weather code was written in MPI, and they wanted to they had run into many problems with load balancing. They wanted to experiment with charm. So they ported their MPI code into Charm using the AMPI framework. If the code is very well written, like Lulish 2.0 was very well written, so we could easily import it into Charm uh, just with very basic flag changes or things like that. And we could get all the benefits that Charm offers, like over decomposition, load balancing, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is the original MPI code, where we can see that <coughs> the Minimum utilization is just about 30%, and maximum is only 55%. This is uh, one process per, per, process per core. There's just one, rank, uh, one, one object per core. This is pretty bad utilization, and this only. So here with over decomposition. Now, what happens is that if you have over decomposed objects, at least when um, when one object is waiting for communication to happen, you know the other object can overlap uh, that that part and then improve the performance overall. So that's what we see here. So at least the average um, average utilization increased a bit, and the minimum went up from 30% to about 55%. In the maximum, so we can see that the utilization is not that good because there is still load imbalance because of which when one process is busy doing work, there are other ones which are idle. So over decomposition helps a little, but with load balancing, what they found is um, it can be very good utilization with almost like you know 85 to 90 percent utilization. So this is a very good example um, to show. That the load balancing helps. The other problem that they had run into in this particular code was, you know, the load balance is not a free thing. You have some overhead associated with it. So it has to take care of migration, it has to take care of doing the strategy, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So how often do we want to do the load balancing? That's also another critical thing. Because if you do it very frequently, then the overhead of the load balancer will um, will be more than the benefit that you get. Um, so in this um, in this application, they kind of hand tuned it and tried to figure out what's a good period to do load balancing. So, but after this, um, we have uh, we have now a framework called Meta Balancer, where you can the the, app, the runtime system or the Meta Balancer framework will watch for uh, watch the application, collecting very minimal stats like what is the average utilization, what is the max utilization. And then it also has information about how much overhead the load balancer is going to take. So depending on what is the benefit you're getting and what is the overhead that you're um, going to incur if you do load balancing, it will decide, OK, it is best to probably do with it X frequency and not more than that. So and that's another addition to this thing. So finally, we see that over decomposition with you know, message-driven execution. Uh, I also gave the talk yesterday about these things, but basically they they help in many aspects. That is, you can because there is over decomposition. When while one work unit is waiting for some message to arrive, the other work unit can you know start doing the work if it's already ready, and that thereby we can uh, eliminate or hide the latency that the messages um, occur. I mean, and so you can overlap communication with competition. With migratability, many other features get enabled, like we can do load balancing, fault tolerance. So the runtime system will migrate the chars from one and the, the process that has um, that is dead. It, it has already checkpointed some of its data into the body process. When we have to restart, we'll move all those information to a new process. That's because we can migrate these jars. And there is job um, availability and many things that we can do with migratability enabled. And then finally is the over decomposition with migratability and asynchronous message driven enables an introspective runtime system. So many features like temperature, constraint, all this we can do uh, with an introspective runtime system. Because it can watch and it can because it can migrate charts, it can do many other things like that. 
I won't, this is all I'll talk about. In case you have more questions about specific features, I can go in detail. <clears throat> Didn't you want to? Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to have a, a little bit more in depth into the tutorial. So we got you started with a very, very simple let's run a main that creates one char and prints out some stuff. Uh, so now we're going to go into a little bit more detail on both the file structure and some of the coding features that Charm++ has that you can take advantage of, and also touch a little bit on what you know common practice is when you're writing uh, programs in Charm++. Uh, so again, we've already kind of talked about this. Uh, anyone familiar with C++ objects, uh, you're going to define those in your .h and .c files, just as you normally would with a few extensions. Uh, the main extension being now we will also basically specify which of these objects are our char objects mm -hmm. and which of the methods of those objects are our entry methods, which can be invoked remotely uh, using a CI file. So again, a CI file just says, it gives an interface a charm saying, here's our chars, here are the messages you can uh, send them via remote method invocation. And again, those methods will also be defined in the .c file. So, more details on the interface file, which we very briefly touched on before. Uh, Charm programs are organized just as a collection of modules. Each module has one or more chars, so you can define whatever chars you need in each particular module. Um, and then the module that does contain the main char is declared the main module. And whenever you compile a module, you end up with this, uh, these two, this pair of header files, this decl.h and this step.h. Uh, and those just need to be included in certain ways in your uh, actual C++ header and C files. Uh, and that's what contains all the auto-generated code that allows you to do things like remote method invocation um, and addressing charts via proxies. Um, so again, chars are our parallel objects. These are what's, uh, the actual entities that are managed by the runtime system. Uh, we give them a set of entry methods in the CI file. Uh, they can be invoked remotely as long as any other char knows the address of some other char in the system, it can remotely invoke a method on it, as long as it's one of these entry methods. Um, so right here, the following code, we have a char in the CI file, it's just a char called myChar, with some method uh, definitions. When we compile it with charm C, it'll just generate a C++ class, C base underscore my char. So you're always going to end up with classes C base underscore and then whatever name you give the char in the CI file. And then the generated class is extended and implemented in the C file. So again, here you'll have the name of your char again, class my char, and it inherits from this generated uh, base class. So our entry methods, again, they can be uh, remotely invoked, and that uh, invocation is asynchronous. So in the CI file, uh, you'll have, for example, your constructor. Then you'll have, here we have two declared entry methods. One entry method is foo, takes no parameters. Your entry methods can also take any standard parameters. For example, this one takes an int as a parameter. And then in the C file, uh, just like for any other method, you would define them uh, my chair, colon, colon, whatever the method is, you have your constructor code, code for the foo, and code for bar. Uh, we touched on this a little bit before, but uh, the main char constructor is where the execution begins in the char++ program. Um, so it takes a ckarg message, which just contains the usual parameters you expect in main, argc and argv. And this is where you will normally set up your system. So you enter in the main chars constructor, and that's where you'll usually set up what other chars are going to be in the system, um, setting up, passing them proxies so they know how to communicate with each other, et cetera. So for actually creating a char, uh, if we have this in our CI file to instantiate it, 
we call the CK new method, the static method on the proxy. So we have the, a proxy for the char we're trying to call. Uh, that this is the uh, generated class as well. And then we call CK new and we pass it the constructor arguments. So whatever arguments you've defined in the entry method for the constructor in the CI file, that's where you pass them here. Um, and then to communicate with the class in the future again, instead of just creating this new class, we also want to store its proxy in some variable. So here we've declared a variable to store the proxy. We create the char and store it later. And then we can actually do the remote method invocation, which we'll talk about here. Um, a little more about proxies. Just like in C++, if you want a pointer to the object itself, you have this. In charm++, we also have uh, a proxy to ourselves. So this proxy is included in the base class of each char, so it can refer to itself. Um, and this way, it can inform other chars about itself. So a char can send along its proxy to other chars so then other chars can, in the future, communicate with it. Um, so again, proxies can be passed to methods. Um, and in this snippet here, we have a entry method that, uh, foobar2, that takes in a proxy here to a main uh, char called main. Um, and then in the C file, here we have uh, the definition of this entry method. Uh, we have pass in our main, and then to invoke an, a method on a proxy, we just do main dot and then whatever method we want to invoke. So in this case, here this line of code would actually invoke the foo uh, method on main remotely, so the runtime system would handle that, uh, looking up where main actually resides in the system, packing up the message, sending it to main, and then uh, with the message driven execution, once the message arrives, uh, this foo will be called by uh, the scheduler on the main object. But you don't do main colon colon, which we did for CK new. So it's right, CK new was just a uh, special. So if we go back, yeah, CK new is just a static method defined on the proxy class, so you don't need an actual instance. Just like in C++, when you have static class level methods, uh, you just call them on a class, but then we have things you actually want to invoke on specific objects. You call them on the specific objects. Uh, same here. So um, there's nothing stopping you from creating multiple uh, chars that are of type main. So this just says I want to send this foo message to this particular uh, proxy, which refers to some specific char in the system. And for charm termination, again, we saw CK exit before. Uh, it ends the uh, parallel execution on all processors. You only have to call it on one, and that performs all the cleanup for charm itself. So instead of calling exit, like in the traditional sense, which would only terminate one process. We just want to make sure that when you're exiting a charm program, you call CK exit, which handles all the cleanup that charm needs and ends the entire application on all processors. And again, this can be called from any char on any process. It doesn't need to be called um, from main or from a particular PE in the system. It can be called from anywhere. OK, so here is the example that you uh, we touched on briefly before. We can go over this in a little more detail. So again, we have some module. Uh, in this case, it's called uh, my module. I think in the example code, I renamed it so it doesn't collide with all the other examples. Um, but so we have uh, two char declarations. Each one is very simple. They only have uh, constructors, no other entry methods. Uh, again, simple takes in two parameters in this constructor. So now when we look in the actual C file, we define the two classes for each char. Um, main, again, inheriting from the generated base class, as well as simple, uh, inheriting from its own generated base class. And then in main, we have our entry to the execution of the charm++ program. It prints out a message, uh, reads in some arguments, and then it goes ahead and uses CK new to create a new simple char. And notice here, we pass in the arguments we want to be passed to the simple char constructor, so that when that char is actually executed, you will see a hello message telling you what PE it's run on, and then a message involving the parameters. Any question on that? The header files at the top and the bottom, do they have to be in the, the quote form, or could you use the, the arrow form? I think that would have to be in the quote form, because they're, they're going to be in the local directory. Right. Yeah. Unless you specify your local directory as a path in the build or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. If it's in the path. <clears throat> It can be 
So again, if we run this try or create example like we just looked at, we see from the main char we have our hello world message, and then from the simple char we have two messages, one saying where it's running from, and one saying something about the radius of a circle. If we run it again and pass in an argument, since the main char takes an argument, now main prints out an additional message saying hello PPL or whatever argument you pass in. OK, so for asynchronous methods, um, entry methods look like any other C++ method call. It's now instead of calling them on an actual object, we're calling it on the proxy. So here we have a, a brief example of creating a new proxy for some char or my char with whatever arguments we might need to pass it. Uh, we store the proxy in a variable. And then if we want to invoke methods foo or var on the proxy, we just do it uh, as if it were any other uh, method call on an object. So again, the runtime system is going to see these, pack them up as messages, find out wherever this, uh, the char referred to by this proxy is actually located, uh, send those messages over the network, and then once those messages are picked by the scheduler on the char's PE, the methods will be executed. And again, just to iterate what we mentioned before, we also uh, always only guarantee for each PE there is exactly one char executing at a time, and that char is only executing one method at a time. So even though we're calling two methods on on this proxy, we know that foo will run as one contiguous method on the proxy, and then var will run, or vice versa. Var may run first, and foo will run, but we know there won't be interference between the two methods. They won't be running at the same time, so we don't need to worry about them uh, with uh, data races on the fields of that char or anything like that, because we have this non-preemptive execution. Uh, one of the tricky things with asynchrony, especially when you're used to uh, something in a more synchronous uh, parallel system, method invocation is not ordered. So in this case, calling foo and then bar, there is no guarantee that foo will execute before bar. So when the messages arrive, they're executed. So bar, if the bar message arrives first, we'll see bar executes this message and then the foo message, or we may see the foo message first and then the bar message. Um, so that's something you have to be aware about. And again, just to keep things general, the charm plus plus runtime doesn't enforce any ordering on message arrival or message sending. However, we give you constructs for doing that uh, on a per char level. So the chars that do need uh, specific causality and control flow uh, constructs, you can do that on the per char level. Uh, again, this also goes for invoking the same message twice. So if we call bar with 7 and then 5, we might see them print out in either order. So can you grab those messages before they <coughs> invoke their char? Is there a higher level, or do you have to have? So for as, as far as ordering goes, we're going to look at something later in the tutorial okay, sure. uh, called SDAG, and that will allow you to not explicitly grab them, per se, but enforce an ordering them on them. Um, yeah, we'll get to that later in the tutorial. Uh, so here's just another example of, again, a very simple system, except now we have this uh, entry method. Um, so here we have an example program using this slightly different simple char, unlike before, where the simple char actually computed. It took uh, two arguments in the constructor and computed the area right there. Now, instead, we create uh, a char, and then 10 times in a row, we call uh, find area. And in this case, find area takes some radius, and then a Boolean flag as to whether the computation is done or not. So we first call it 10 times in a row, saying find the area from 1 to 10, and we're not done. And then we send it another message saying, OK, find the area for a circle of radius 10, and we are done. So the question is, does this program execute as expected? Anybody? No. OK, I no. see a couple no's. But, but your pi set will be done first as a constructor. Right. So the pi will be set correctly. However, because of asynchrony, we essentially have 
uh, 11, well, actually in this case, yeah. not a 10, uh, 10 message sends here. And since there's no guarantee in the ordering, these messages could arrive in any order, so there's nothing stopping this sort of terminating message to arrive first, and we only end up getting one area printed out. Uh, as far as what you can pass to entry methods, um, you can pass all the basic C++ primitive types, int, chars, bools, that will all work fine. Uh, you can also pass at least most C++ STL data structures without any problem. Um, you can pass uh, your native C style arrays uh, in the following way. So in the CI file, you say, if for this method here, foobar, we want to pass some array of data. We first pass an int saying how much data there is, and then the array of data itself. And then the C file, the actual entry method would look like this. So it has a length, and then it has a pointer to some data. And so we guarantee that when we're doing ascending, we know how much data to actually sent across the wire. We need this extra length parameter. And then when it arrives in our remote chart, you also have the length of the data itself. This is actual code. It's not like we have to put length in the number. Yeah, that's, that's a variable. Right? Yeah, that right. that yep. refers to the variable okay. directly. Yeah, so you can variables. call this without any extra recompilation or anything. You can call this method passing an array of size 2 and then an array of size 4 or whatever. So, so far we've seen examples of just creating one single char object uh, at a time with this CK new. However, for large computations, especially uh, that want to be very scalable, that run on supercomputers, for example, oftentimes we obviously want you know, a very large number of chars. So to make this easier, we have uh, uh, groups of chars are called are what are called char arrays that I'll go over now. So these char objects can be grouped into index collections. Um, some examples of when you want to do this is a, a block of a matrix, a chunk of unstructured mesh. Uh, portions of a distributed data structure, volume of simulation space, uh, and then a more example, advanced examples, uh, just abstract portions of computation, interactions among basic objects and reality. So basically you can declare arrays of charts, so you have large collections, and as we'll look at, they can take a couple different forms. So you can have very structured collections of uh, a 1D, 2D, up to 6D collection of chars. Uh, you can also have an unstructured collection of chars where you actually provide the indexing yourself, and as long as that indexing is hashable, um, you can have a collection of chars defined in that manner. And these collections can also be dense or sparse. So, for example, um, in one of our uh, molecular dynamics mini applications, we have a 6D um, collection of chars that do computation between pairs of cells, however, not every single entry in the 6D array is actually has a char there uh, because we only are concerned about um, entries that correspond to pairs in the actual 3D uh, array of cells. And then you can also have the distinction between static and dynamic. So you can create a uh, collection of chars right up front and say this is the size of the the array and that's how it's going to stay, or you can dynamically insert these elements as you need more uh, char objects or delete them when they are done. So here's another example from the uh, tutorial code section. This is a, an array based, uh, a char array based example of a Hello World program. So here we have again our main module, in this case it's called ARR. Um, again, we have our main char main. And then here, instead of declaring a singular char, so before we'd have char, the keyword char here, now we're saying we want an array of chars. We want a 1D array of chars, and these chars will be called hello chars. Um, we have our constructor that accepts an integer. And then we have our uh, just another entry method on this array uh, called print hello. And this, again, is in the uh, example under array hello.ci and .c. So here we have the C, uh, the C file. So the main constructor, for the most part, looks the same, except we now, uh, in the arguments from the command line, we accept some array size. And now when we do the creation, we're no longer creating just a singular char. So when we actually create the object, when we say CK new, the first argument we have to pass it is how many chars we want in this array. 
So here we're creating a uh, char array of hello chars, and there's going to be this array size number of elements, and then anything after that is the normal constructor arguments. So to each char in that array, we're also going to pass it the array size. Uh, and then here we have a method invocation on a char array. So again, we have a proxy p to this char array, and then we index it so we want to get the zeroth element of this array and actually send the print hello message to that specific char. Now if we look at the uh, hello char itself, again it inherits from C base hello. Um, it has a field for the array size, which it accepts at construction and sets it there. So that's the second one. Yes. So you always, when you call CK new, you tell it the size of each dimension. So for example, if we had a 3D, you have to tell it the size of the X, Y, and Z dimensions. And then every argument after the uh, first arguments for the dimension size, that's where you actually pass in whatever arguments the char itself needs. Um, so in this case, in, uh, when we call print hello, it first prints out a message saying um, hello from, and then whatever char index in the array it is, and also it uh, tells you what PE that char is on. And then if we're the last char in the array, so this is why we passed in the array size, if our index is equal to the array size minus one, we'll exit. Otherwise, we're going to send a message to the next char in the array. So again, uh, like each char has a this proxy, it also, when we're dealing with char arrays, has uh, an, a field for its own index. So in this case, we see here that the char is going to get its own proxy, which is the proxy for the entire array. And then it'll get its own index, increment that by one, and send a message, essentially sending that message to the next uh, element in the array. Sorry, you may have said I missed it, but in the CK new, which of those arguments is the array size? The first, the, arguments that start the first uh, n arguments, or an n dimensional array, are going to be the sizes of each dimension. And then everything after that is the um, arguments of the constructor. So if we look at the tutorial code again, uh, we've already made array hello. So if we do charm run, we'll run it on four processors. And again, this expects you to pass in the size of the array. So if we want to do it on an array of size 16, for example, we see that each char reported what PE it happened to be on, and then hello from the first one, second one, all the way down <coughs> to the 15th one. And notice how here we have this causal ordering, because in the actual way we did the messaging, we first sent to PE0, it did its printing, uh, and then it sends the message to the next char. Uh, uh, elements of the array go to one char. Right. So you can provide your own mappings, and by default, I think it's a block mapping. Uh, it depends on the array dimension and whether you specify the size up front. Basically, we try to set defaults that would give you same behavior. Yeah. Um, applications that get involved do not nearly all specify a mapping themselves. But yeah, we, we, we just block. Uh, Look, yeah, yeah, divide it up. Yeah. And again, this is this is the initial mapping of the chars. If if we're doing dynamic load balancing, for example, uh, each element of the array can be migrated if need be to improve load balance, etc. Okay, so I see the constructor with intent in it. Yep, that's the one you actually called. Right. What's the other one? So when we're dealing with migration, uh, here we have a an extra constructor for that ends up being called during migration. I think we're going to touch on this later during the, yeah. the migration example. And then this index is an integer. Yes, in, in this case. Oh. However, again, if you have, for example, more unstructured collections that you want, uh, you can define your indices to be anything that's hashable. For example, in even Barnes Hut, I think. Don't, don't even get okay. there. Even in the 2D case, that's an object that contains an x, y pair. Yeah, so if it was a 2D array, this index dot x would give you the x coordinate and this index dot y. This proxy is a pointer to the entire superstructure. 
the right. proxy to the whole collection. Yeah. So if it's 2D, you have this proxy bracket, one bracket. Uh, you'd use params there. Oh, is, yeah. You can use parens for any dimension. We should probably just do that consistently. Okay. That's just a limitation of C++ syntax. That you can't pass multiple arguments in the operator or square bracket. So one thing, again, we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but we have a tool in Charm++ called projections. Uh, so if you enable projections for a specific run of your program, uh, Charm++ and the runtime, the runtime system will collect performance data that you can later look at to see uh, more details on how an application performed. And just to show uh, a sample of uh, projections plot for this particular application, uh, run, like it looks like 12 cores. Uh, here we have a timeline view, and we can see uh, so the, the white is idle time, and then this yellow chunk is when it's actually executing uh, a message. So we see in this case, uh, we have on PE0, we ended up with a bunch of small method invocations as we started off in the array. And then once the message got to a certain part of the array that was on a different processor, we have this communication here. And then we pick up here, and it kind of has this stepping down until we end up processing the message at every single uh, char in the array and then eventually exit. Um, so the projections tool is going to be useful for just looking at different aspects of the performance of a run and kind of trying to figure out where improvements can be made. And projections is something we're going to go over in more detail later. So you can see that this is how not to write good code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This isn't supposed to be an example of, of good code. <laughs> this is obviously bad for parallel performance. Uh, so here's just a little bit more detail on arrays. So again, instead of the char keyword, if you're actually uh, declaring an array of chars, you have array, and then the brackets followed by the uh, 1D, 2D, 3D, up to 6D. Uh, and then your constructors and entry methods, just as if uh, they were any other char you're defining. And in addition, and same with uh, the actual classes or structs you define in the C file, everything pretty much looks the same. Even the name of the class you're inheriting from, you just now have this additional constructor, which for the time being, we're just going to leave empty. We're not looking at migration of chars. We're just looking at uh, collections of chars and how to create and use them. In, in the previous example, I was just trying to look, the, this proxy um, uh, uh, variable there, that, that got created by charm through the co compilation. Yeah, so the C base hello is going to contain this proxy, and for um, arrays, it will also contain this index. Is there a list of all methods that are created? In um, methods and variables. Uh, keep still poking through the header. So oh, I mean, the header you can just look at. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a mixed set of things. Uh, Maybe we should have an appendix in the manual that enumerates that kind of thing. We don't currently. Yeah. I think, I mean, in the majority of cases, this proxy, this index, and CK new will get you through a lot of index, stuff. CK new, at sync, uh, contribute, reasons, abort, actually, is so that we can print which element. Yeah. There's lots of stuff that. Stuff that could be enumerated, but is mostly not of immediate interest. Okay, yeah, especially there's usually only three things that people care about. The okay. Kind of security security security. So as far as here we go in a little more detail about constructing the char array. Um, so it's constructed uh, similar to a regular char with CK new, except now you just need to pass in also the size of each dimension. So in this case for foo, we had our one-dimensional array. We want it to be of size 10. Here we're creating a two-dimensional array with the first dimension of size 5, the second dimension of size 5. And again, you may retain the proxy just as before, so you can message the char. And the proxy does represent the entire array. So to actually message an individual element in that array, you index it uh, with the bracket or parentheses syntax, um, and then call the method as you would normally. Uh, this index is, again, in a 1D case, it just is an index of the current char array element. Uh, in a 2D case, uh, it's an object with an x and a y. For the current 
primary element and similar for 3D, 4D, et cetera. Um, so this very, very simple example, when the foo is constructed, it would just print out what index in the array is. Uh, so here again is the hello example, which we've already looked at. I don't think this is any different. Yeah. OK, so here's how the runtime is actually going to treat these objects. So the system is going to know how to find the objects efficiently based on what collection it's part of and what index it can find its processor. Uh, so again, the applications can specify a mapping. Or if not, the runtime system will try and provide something sane, such as block or round robin mapping. Uh, and the distribution can be static or dynamic. Um, but the key, the key thing about this is the application logic doesn't even doesn't change at all. What, not even depending on what mapping you specify. Not in the face of migrations. As long as you have that proxy to that array, you can use that proxy with an index to find any element in the array, regardless of where it is, regardless of whether it's moved. You can call methods without needing to deal with that bookkeeping yourself. That's all handled by the runtime system. Um, so what's nice about that is you can develop and test the logic for the objects without worrying about how they're distributed in the system or where they locate. Um, you have separation of time, division of labor, portability, shared progress. Uh, so all these things allow you to really focus on the logic of your application and what it's supposed to be doing rather than the logic of how do I get these onto the processors? How do I make sure this runs efficiently? That can all be handled by the runtime system. And you can guide that, but again, that can happen completely separately from the actual logic of your application itself. So here is just uh, an example to kind of drive the point home. We have uh, multiple different arrays. We have our C array here, which is two-dimensional. Uh, we have an A array here, which is dense. We have A0, A1, and 2. We have a one-dimensional B array that's sparse. We only have elements 0 and 3. Uh, the C array is also sparse, it looks like. Uh, and so these elements are all going to communicate with each other in some fashion. Uh, C uh, elements are going to communicate with A's and B's. And the runtime system can manage how these are going to go on the processors without you having to worry about it. Um, so here we have just a, an example mapping of the different array elements processors. So notice we can have not only uh, the arrays being mapped separately, but even elements from different arrays on different processes so we get that uh, very high degree of composability and modularity we talked about before. And then with the uh, message-driven execution, whichever uh, particular array element has method decisions for it will actually execute on the processor, giving us that overlap uh, of communication and computation. So another very common feature in a lot of parallel applications is collective communication. And this uh, kind of goes naturally with our collections of chars. So our point-to-point -point operations, which we've talked about so far, are just two objects, the sender and the receiver. Um, however, collective operations, we can uh, have, well, now that we have collections of objects, we can have collective operations on these collections. Uh, so the two we'll talk about right now are broadcast and reduction. So if we have a char, uh, a char array and we want to broadcast something uh, to every single element in the array, we can simply call a method that broadcasts to the array. Uh, and with the reduction, we would collect a contribution from each element in the object of array to form some final result. And in both cases, a spanning tree is used to send and receive data, so we do that efficiently. Uh, so broadcasts in charm are very simple. So again, we want to send a message to each object in the collection. Uh, we already have this char array proxy object, so we can use that for the broadcast as well as our point-to-point -point sends that we've already seen. And this just looks like any other function call to the proxy object, just now we don't use an index. So if we have this hello array here, which is an array of hello chars of this size. If we want to broadcast a method to every single char in that array, Instead of indexing the proxy, we just call foo on the proxy itself. And this will send a foo message, therefore invoking the foo method on each uh, individual element in the array. And if, for example, you want to, if you are already part of that array and you want to send a message to everyone in the array, you again have this proxy. So this proxy.foo will allow you to broadcast to the array. 
and from another char, again, that has a proxy p to the char array, again, p.foo will do the broadcast of the whole array. Uh, so reduction is kind of the inverse of that. We want to take some sort of set of values from each element in the array and then either sum them, max them, aggregate them, do some sort of operation on them to end up with one single result. Uh, so here again, we usually result reduced to a set of, uh, or some single value. Uh, so the combination of these values requires some sort of operator. Uh, much like MPI, the operator must be associative. Uh, it also must be commutative in this case, since we're doing uh, these asynchronous reductions. We don't necessarily know how these uh, operations are going to be applied. And then each object in the uh, array itself, when we want to do a reduction, just calls a special uh, contribute method to contribute whatever data it has to the reduction. So here would be a CI file if we're going to have uh, some sort of reduction going on. In this case, uh, we have some array of elements uh, that are going to do something. Um, at construction time, they get a proxy back to this main proxy, so they all know how to communicate with it. And then now, in addition to its constructor, where we enter the execution of the program, main also has this special reduction target method that will be the target of this reduction. So how this is going to work is every element in the array is going to contribute to the reduction, and once we have the final result, it will show up here in this in this done entry method, which is the target of the reduction. We'll see how that looks in the C file next. So um, the bracket reduction target, that's literal. So I'm just going to substitute. That's, that's the code. Yes. Okay. Yep. So this is just saying that when we tag a method as a reduction target, in this case, we know there's going to be some sort of reduction that's going to be called, and it's going to end up with an int as the result, and that will end up here. This is the code. So yep. Like standing. No, when, when there are placeholders in what we show, we're going to be very explicit. Okay. Yes. And also, I forgot to mention, this code is also in the tutorial code. It's uh, called reduction main target, I believe. Um, I'll look at that in a sec. Um, so here we have the C file. So we have some number of elements in our array. I'll just define that as a constant right now. Um, and then, so what main does is the constructor simply creates uh, an array of these objects by passing it a proxy to itself, so they know how, where to send the result, essentially, and the number of elements in the uh, computation. And then upon creation, each element will use its index as a value, in this case, and then what we do is uh, each element will, we're doing a sum reduction of basically the indexes in the array. So first, we create a callback to say where we want the uh, reduction to end up. In this case, our reduction target is going to be called on a main proxy, and it's the done reduction target, which is defined up there. And the specific proxy that we want it to be called on is, is our main proxy that got passed in that construction. And then uh, we have our value, and we are contributing. So we call this contribute method, or function, which uh, we say how much data we're contributing, what data we're actually contributing, which in this case is just our index, and then uh, we say what kind of reduction it's going to be. In this case, we're summing integers. What are your choices? You can sum doubles. You can do a max. Uh, yeah, sum doubles, max. Uh, there's a fairly yeah, exhaustive list in, in the, the manual. The manual contains a yeah, it's, I mean, mostly what you expect, min, max, um, different kinds of sums. There's logical order. Yeah. Yeah, concatenation. There's, there's, set, uh, there's set union and there's concatenation of the list. Can you move reduction function to the main proxy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sometimes it would make more sense this way. So I don't want my element chair to know how to reduce the values, but I would like to know. I would like to put this piece in the main chart. Is that possible? Well, for I mean, I guess, for example, instead of passing the main proxy here, the main proxy could have given it a callback saying where we want the reduction to go. And then each char, for example, could say, I'm going to uh, contribute my value to some callback that someone told me to contribute to. Is that sort of what you're getting at? In this case, the, the, the scope of the index data is to the element. The main chart doesn't have that data. 
Oh yeah, so there's there's a particular point here, which is that that reduction is a reduction over the elements of that jar array. So it looks for exactly one contribution from every member of the collection. So because main isn't part of a collection, there's nothing to reduce over. So if it has a value, it has one value. So the reduction function have to be pointed inside the collection. Yeah. Yeah. So what's this? How come the, the constructor arguments don't match with the definition of element? Um, meaning the order? Well, there's this proxy, which is M proxy, and then there's num elements, which just vanish. Yeah. So, uh, so that might be a typo on oh. the slide. Yeah, that might be a typo on the slide. Right, right, yeah. That, so that's a typo on the slide relative to what we described earlier. It works because there's a variant syntax that this leads to. You know, there's an overload for CK new. It doesn't. It's not actually just the swapped order. That would be very confusing. But there is a different kind of object that can encapsulate size and several other options for array construction that I think is uh, being default. It's being. But we could switch them. That would be okay. In this case, yeah. no, no, no. In this it case, it's a flip. In this case, yeah. that, that works. So the first part is what is going to be in, in the constructor, and the second last part is x, y, z, the number of elements you want. No, no, but that, well, why can't we do it the no. other way? Because you said you could do it. No, no, it's. What's happening is there is an overload for this where instead of passing the size as numerical arguments, you can pass a single object of type CK array options. And CK array options happens to have a constructor from a single integer. So, yeah, this is just a strange type of that happened to work out. But if yeah. we, if you had written the other this way, works for one D array. This works for one D, but not for anything more. No, but if you swap the order of the slot, yeah, it would work, and we would not be asking this question. Yes, yes. yes. So yes. that's what well, I wanted to know. I like, right, <laughs> should yeah, yeah, you yeah. should imagine it as just a compiler error. number of elements. This proxy. Uh, Thank you. It wants the box. It wants the instructor already first. Okay. Do we screw that up on the slide again? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we screwed that up in the earlier slides. I think it was in the, in the, explan in the explanation that you gave. Yeah. Usually it's the it's, it's well, uh, dimension. Yeah. Dimension is the trailing. The yeah. first part is the constructor argument. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. You're right. Um, we apparently didn't check all of these carefully as we should have and confused ourselves. So we should just reverse everything we heard? Apparently, yes. yes. Okay. Um, also, MTI is better for writing complicated uh, parallel applications. Reverse <laughs> everything. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, and let's. We could yeah. So let's look at the actual code to hopefully disambiguate some of this. So again, here we have the, the CI file for this reduction, uh, which we've looked at before. And then if we look at the CPP file, we have our creation of the array where we say the arguments and then how many elements are on the array. That's, that's the correct ordering. And then in the array itself, here we have the re we first uh, create a callback to say where the reduction should end up when it's completed. Uh, in this case, again, we want to call the done method of a main char. And then this is the particular main char that we want to call that method on. And then we contribute something of size int, which is our index in this case. Uh, we want to sum them and then to the uh, we contribute that specific callback. Mm -hmm. And then if we again now look at what the callback does, in this case it just takes in some value, which will be the result of the reduction. Uh, in this case we have a simple check to just, because we know if, if we have elements, you know, 0 through 49, we know what the sum should be. So we're checking to make sure that the value is the correctly reduced value. We print it out and then we call exit on the program. So if we run this, uh, it's not going to look terribly interesting, but it should run. 
So again, here we, we ran it. It's created 49 array elements. Each one contributed to a reduction, its own index, uh, a sum reduction, and then the sum of those happens to be uh, 1,176. So now we've seen broadcast and reduction. Just another quick note about reduction. So just like point-to-point -point communication, <coughs> these broadcasts and reductions are going to be completely asynchronous. So for example, when this element calls uh, contribute, it sends off its data to the uh, reduction, and then it can carry on with whatever it's doing. In this case, it's just going to end its constructor, and another element can contribute. But these reductions can happen asynchronously, as well as the broadcasts using the spanning tree. How many arguments can CKU take? Like, so in this case, there was the one num element. Is there three or four others that it can take that may or may not appear in the constructor? Uh, it's like it had this proxy num elements, which num elements is, I guess, as interpreted, we were talking about this earlier, and outside of the, the constructor of the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the most part, you're usually going to see it just taking whatever the constructor arguments are and then the and a size for each dimension of the array. So if it's 60 array, you will have six sizes. Oh, so there'll be six. Okay. Yes. And then um, there's the, the general class of stuff for complicated options. Yeah. Which is there's the there's the CK ops object. Oh, okay. That, that you can create that, and you can set a whole bunch of parameters in there, and then pass that, and in. then pass that as the final argument. Yes. So you oh. either pass the sizes explicitly if you just want to say create me an array of this size, or if you want more control. You create this array options object and tell the size and any other information you might need. Pass no, those it, are the variety of parameters. Things you might set in there would be whether or not, if, if you wanted uh, the array not to be migratable, for example, that's one of the things you can set in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you can define what the mapping choice for placement of array objects okay. would be. Okay. You can define the object that does the mapping that would want to be pass in comps. There's lots of things about the arrays to get non default. OK, so now we're going to move on a little bit to talk about more about the overseas composition in Charm and how that works. So in this case, we're going to start looking at a divide and conquer paradigm uh, in Charm++. So in the divide and conquer, each object is going to recursively create n objects that divide the problem into subproblems. And each object T will wait for all n objects to finish and then combine the responses. Um, so at some point in the recursion, at the bottom of the tree, there's going to be some sequential process that sort of knows to stop there. And then the result is propagated back up the tree. Sorry, sorry. can I ask you something about reduction? What sure. if I want to reduce an array? Uh, not, so not just sum the entry, but like get 10 parallel sums. Oh, and yeah. Yes. Is it yes. an animal too? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to flip that to the example code? Mm -hmm. Show how to do that. Oh, the example code. Well, you got it right here. Yeah, yeah. So if you see this, contribute size of int. So in that case, we're just, we're just so we're doing one in, right? Yeah. We could change that to four times size of int and do it across four ints. Okay. And then we just add so a we extra change, four ints. And, we have, and, and then the, the done itself would have to be not the int value, but the int star value. Okay. Okay, so, okay. so it's pretty transparent. Yeah. I think it, it gets harder with multi dimensional arrays when you want to do across one index right. of the array. Yeah. So some examples of just this divide and conquer that are pretty canonical are, are Fibonacci or quicksort. And we're actually going to look at a Fibonacci example now. So this is going to be a very naive implementation of, of Fibonacci just to show a nice recursive structure and how Charm++ would deal with it. Um, so in this case, we're going to define these Fib objects. Each object will perform one of two actions. Either it's going to create two new Fib objects to solve the subproblems uh, Fibonacci of n minus 1 and n minus 2, and then wait for a response. Or if you know it's either trying to solve Fib of 1 or 0, it knows what the answer is right away, so then it just returns it to its parent. So we're going to end up creating this tree of Fibonacci objects, and when we hit the bottom, we're at either n equals 1 or 0, and then that result will get propagated back up to the root. So for example, if we start by wanting to compute Fib of 5, 
that object will spawn one object computing fib of four and fib of another object computing fib of three, and in turn each of those will spawn two children con uh, to compute their subproblems. And eventually we get to the bottom of the tree uh, down here, and the result then from each object will be about propagated back up to its parents. And eventually, Fib5 will get the results of Fib4 and Fib3, add those together, and we have the Fibonacci number, uh, the fifth Fibonacci number. So, so in that tree, for example, uh, from 4, Fib4, four, Fib2 four, is, is known privately to Fib4. Yes. So is there a mechanism to uh, Fib4 to create Fib2 in a collection that's accessible from others. So Fib3 also needs Fib2. Right. So yeah, so this is a this is an extremely just naive example, but for example, if you wanted to do this in an array, for example, you could have chars created at the indices. Like for example, we could have a, a char created at Fib2 that's just in charge of computing the Fibonacci number for two, and then since Fib4 and Fib3 are both part of that array, they have, you know, they know the direct and address of this next Right. Yeah. So, and you can do a sparse array, so. Right. OK. So, it, sorry, I'm trying to understand this example. I mean, I understand it in the mathematical sense. Mm -hmm. So each, like, Fib5 is a char. Yeah, so and we're going to actually. CK news two Fibs? Right. So we're going to actually look at this in code, and yeah, essentially, just to be very explicit and close to this like mathematical yeah, model, cool. we're going to make each fib object here a char. At construction, it's going to receive a number. So for example, this fib would be constructed with number five. It would call CK new twice to create two new chars, each responsible for computing their specific subproblem. And we go down the tree and then oh, but it would also walk pass the whole process. Right, right. Yeah, you want to just pull up the code rather than uh, isn't that no no no? Yeah, there's some other things next. Yeah, I was wondering about. The yeah, so if we look at the code then, so so for example, here we have our our CI file, we have our main char, and then each fib object takes uh, the number it wants to compute, uh, a boolean saying whether or not it's the root of the tree and then uh, proxy to its parent, and then also has this respond method, and then if we look at the C file. So here uh, at construction, if n is less than 2, it's just going to respond with n. Um, otherwise, it goes ahead and it'll create two new proxies, telling them to compute the subproblem n minus 1 and n minus 2. Uh, those two proxies obviously are not the root, of the tree, and it passes its own proxy so they communicate back. So n less than 2 is n zero, fib of 0, fib 1. Yeah, so if n is less than 2, we know, for example, both 0 and 1 are just going to be the uh, 1. Um, and then, so this is a slightly more, so we're actually going to show two versions of the Fibonacci to highlight one of the features, but for now, uh, res what respond does is it takes whatever value it received from its children, presumably, add it to its result. Then if, since count starts off as 2, if count ends up at 0, we know we've received both results from our children. And then we decide, okay, if we're the root, we finish the computation. Otherwise, we send our result to our parents and, and delete ourselves. You don't need it once you told your daddy. Or you to do, because you need to link yourself <laughs> like that. Because <laughs> kids, kids would do that. So <laughs> to link yourself as you're executing, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, so the first instance, the parent, it has a very funky way of getting the proxy for itself as it's getting created. Huh? Yeah, it's just going to get some dummy proxies that we know it's never going to use. Um, because as long as it's the root, it's not going to try and communicate with a parent that doesn't exist. Um, so just for the sake of argument, you could cast the void star. Or we we also or probably could have just overloaded the constructor to take two arguments in the case where it didn't need a parent. 
or something like that. Yeah, there's a couple or we could have done the polymorphic thing also where we pass a proxy that is either fib or main. And have the result end up back at main. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, is this a proxy, or is that the specific instance of the, of the object and not a proxy? The oh, this. This is just like in C++, it's just a direct pointer to yourself. So, OK, so that's me, the, the yes. real char. Yeah. As a, so, so, so can you delete an object through a proxy? Yes, you can. OK. Um, the method is called CK destroy. Oh, OK. So if I call this proxy pointer over CK destroy, that's the same equivalent. Yeah. Um, the reason you, we couldn't call it delete is because that's a keyword in C++. So we couldn't say, you know, this or proxy whatever dot delete because the compiler would say delete doesn't go there. Yeah, it's an operator. Yeah. So shouldn't you have the method that is called annotated with that special annotation that says which is a reduction method? So in this case, we're not actually doing any reduction. Um, it's just so when, when you're done with your computation, you just send a single point-to-point -point message to your parent saying, this is, this is the result I got. And then when you receive a value from a child, you just add it to your current result. So you start off with zero as your result. You create two children. Eventually, the first one will report back saying, I've computed my problem. You add that to your result. Uh, if you haven't gotten both responses, you'll just not do anything. And then when the second child eventually responds, you'll accumulate his part of the results and then actually do the, you know, if your root printed out, if not, respond to your own parent. So what is the respond method actually called after you call C proxy P or C A U? So once we call these, we're actually creating two new chars. And again, those chars will, will start up in their constructor. Um, when they do have a result, uh, for example, if they're at the bottom of the tree, they'll end up calling respond on themselves, which if it's uh, n is less than 2 and they're not the root, then they call respond on their parents. And that will be a message sent to the parent child that created them. So, and again, this is one version of Fibonacci, and then we have a better version later to highlight one of the features we haven't yet got to. Um, but this is how you would do it uh, just with what you have, what knowledge you have right now. On it. That's that's weird. I'll just re. Yes, it's a full screen button. Okay. So again, with over decomposition, the key is to let the programmer decompose the computation into objects, which we can also refer to as work units, data units, etc. Um, and the key is we want them to be able to define those objects the way that's natural to the problem, not in a way that is required by the machine. Um, and then the intelligent runtime system, in this case, can actually assign the objects to the processors, uh, can change the assignment during execution. If we want to do, for example, dynamic load balancing or fault tolerance. Um, the locality of the data is uh, good, uh, provides us good performance. Like we said, each object is going to encapsulate its own state, which is generally small. So we're going to have uh, that should all fit in the cache. Um, a parallel object can access only its own data, just like in uh, standard object-oriented programming, as long as you define your uh, actual state as private, uh, it can only be accessed. And so we have the same idea here with our parallel objects. Again, we, that helps prevent data raises and keep this nice, clean encapsulation. Uh, we have asynchronous method invocation for accessing other objects' data. And then the RTS can schedule work whose dependencies have been satisfied. Basically, if you have work to do because you have a message waiting for you, you can be executed to your work. If not, we're not going to sit there. And we're going to actually schedule someone else who does have work. Uh, so this kind of gets into discussion of grain size and Amdahl's law. So again, remember, if we have k percent uh, sequential section, then we can't do any better speed up wise than 100 over k, essentially. Um, and that's if the rest of the program is completely parallelized. So as a corollary for, for grain size, if any particular piece of uh, work or any of our work units uh, takes greater than k time units and the sequential program takes some sequential time, then we have this 
uh, limiting factor or speed up of the sequential time over this uh, grain size. Um, so one thing we've done is we've examined performance data based on uh, varying the grain size to see how the performance varies. And if some are too big or too small, for example, you need to change the decomposition. So this is actually where our students are. OK, cool. And yes, I shall take over and talk about grain size. Can you re-explain this grain size? <laughs> so there, there are some useful graphics that I think will illustrate this quite helpfully in a minute. More or less. So on value node, yes. So imagine you take your work and you divide it up into some arbitrary set of bits. That's what they would call the grain size. If one of them is really giant, then that's it. And you should cut it if you want more parallel. And so figuring out what the good grain size is. Because usually if you cut the grain size, you need more communication. Yes. That's There's exactly right. Yeah. You have to tip the decomposition. Exactly. I'll talk about that um, in the next slide. So basically, as you mentioned, um, uh, so the limiting factor is going to be the char size or the grain size of the, the largest grain size. Because even if you could parallelize all other objects very nicely, this largest object is going to determine how much of a speed up you can get. Like on one process, it takes 10 seconds. That grain size on 100 processes will still take 10 seconds to execute on one process. And that will be the limiting factor, even if you could nicely parallelize all other things. So there's this misconception that if you keep the over decomposing, the, uh, if you do too much over decomposition, there is um, a lot of expense to it. But that's not really true. There is some overhead to it, which we'll talk about. And what do we mean by grain size, basically? So the amount of computation that you do for this, maybe you're receiving a message when you receive a message. That is what a grain size is, basically. But when you get an event to execute, a, um, um, execute some amount of work, that is what is a grain size. So, based, um, so the idea is we want to, uh, there is an overhead. Let's say messaging takes some overhead. We don't want to make the grain size too small, that the overhead is going to be much more than the grain size. That's the key idea. So should the grain size depend on the number of processes? Well, let's look at this particular thing that we are talking about. The grain, grain size is, um, is basically the computation per message, let's say. And let's say V is the overhead per the message, and TP is um, the execution time for um, when we parallelize this particular work among P processes. And G is the grain size. <coughs> so the, the, the time taken on one processor is going to be whatever sequential time you used to take plus the overhead, which is V, per message that you get out of the grain size. So you are incurring some amount of overhead too. And when you parallelize it totally, the, the execution time will depend on what either what is your largest grain size or the T1 by P, which is basically how much of a time did you take uh, along with the overhead plus the grain size size. So that's what it will depend on. So either the grain size, if the grain size is too huge, then the parallel execution time will depend on the grain size. But if the grain size is too small, then the overhead will determine how, um, what is the parallel execution time. That's the idea here. And here is a graph that basically shows how the execution time will depend on grain size. Um, if we have very tiny grain sizes, then the overhead, let's say it took one millisecond for the message uh, overhead, and the grain size is just 10 microsecond or 20 microsecond. So the overhead will determine what is your execution time. But if, um, if your grain size is too large, and there are, um, let's say, P processes, then the maximum grain size will determine what is the execution time. And as we increase the number of processes, so let's say there is a one char with 10 seconds, as I mentioned. Even if we increase the number of processes, 
all of the charts could be evenly distributed, which were only one second. But there is one processor which gets the 10 second chart. And that will determine the execution time. So you will, how much ever you do the parallelization, this 10 second time will be incurred. So it, the execution time will also depend on the number of processors. So the grain size, the ideal grain size is between this and this point, as you can see. So it should just be more than to amortize the overhead that you get. This is a real run that was done on JYC for Jacobi 3D. So this is a 3D um, decomposition where um, the total problem size is 2K cross 2K cross 2K. And, and as we number of points per char is the grain size, as we increase the grain size, and the y-axis is the time per second. So for the same problem, as we increase the grain size, how does it affect the time per step? We see that, again, for very tiny grain sizes, there is the time per step is high, but there is a range in between this, this we call a path of curve, where there's a range in between where all the grain sizes kind of give the same time per step. But beyond a larger grain size, that will cause the bottleneck. Um, that will, you know, so basically you're not able to paralyze very well. And other processes are sitting idle when one processor is executing that large green size chart. <laughs> so there are, these are other graphs which show this, the same kind of result. So typically what we have seen using experimentation is about eight chars or 10 chars per core is sufficient to, uh, you know, get the adequate um, uh, benefit of over decomposition. That's a typical um, thing that we try in an uh, in a application run. But the ideal way to do it is, you know, how much of a overhead are we incurring, and what should be the minimum size of the grain size to amortize this overhead. So. <clears throat> There's another factor to it. Load, load balancing is also affected by the grain size, right? So if we have a distribution like, like this, so x-axis is grain size in millisecond, and um, y-axis is the number of objects. So if you have a large number, of, uh, if you have like some distribution like this, where many objects are very tiny size, and there are some objects which are really large size, then it becomes tricky to load, load balance. Let's say the average load of a processor is only um, 20 milliseconds after doing this thing. And we find that there are objects even 40 milliseconds. So we have to put that object in some processor. And that processor will take 40 milliseconds to execute, whereas others will finish in about 20 milliseconds or 30. So the grain size. We should try to shrink the grain size as much as possible, uh, but just enough to amortize the overhead cost. So the solution is to split the objects, computation objects, so that um, they may not have too much work, which makes it difficult for the load balancer to actually balance them out. They should be of tiny size. So we can use many heuristics to uh, decide how do you want to do the decomposition. So here's an example of that. This is molecular dynamic simulation. Um, so basically, the strong scaling is, is limited by the most overloaded processor. And if the most, the most overloaded processor has the largest char, then it's going to be limited by that. So what do we, um, what do, we do to uh, you know, reduce the grain size? So there is uh, one FV in which these the square patches are the cells. The 3D um, space is over decomposed into multiple charts. These are called cells. And the diamond ones are the computes. They calculate the pairwise uh, poses between the cells. Uh, the cells are uh, decomposed such that you know they are within the they, they are within the cutoff distance. So if you want to find interaction between two cells, then you will calculate the interaction between them. They put, so, um, yeah, this is the 1D decomposition. So we find that in 1D decomposition, that's the uh, that's using the tool called projections. You can get the distribution of um, grain size uh, and the number of objects 
uh, using this projection tool. So you can find out how many objects have large brain size and how many have tiny brain size. So this is the distribution of that. We find that, like in the other example we saw, there are many of them with, most of them with the tiny brain size, but there are indeed some of them with very large brain size. So what do we do in this in this case? Well, we can do k away, 2 away, 3 away, or k away. So what do we do? We split the cell into two. But now to calculate the force interactions for this cell, you will have to talk to not just one neighbor, you'll have to talk to two neighbors. So you're decomposing further down, you're making the brain size smaller, but yeah, by incurring some extra uh, extra messages in this case. So by doing that that kind of decomposition, we get a better, you know, better distribution of this. So now we will be able to better load balance and make sure that none of the grain sizes much larger than the average process uh, load. So the rule of thumb is, this is a very common question that we get from people that how much, what should be the number of chars, how much should be over decomposed. So this is the thing that he says, make it as small as you can so that the, uh, the it, it amortizes the overhead. And so let's say if V is the overhead, we can say, okay, 10 times the overhead. Let's, let's pick a grain size that is 10 times the overhead. And no single grain size should be too large. Let's say um, on an average, everybody, all the processors have one, one second of load. But there is this particular um, char with 10 seconds of load. And again, the time per step is going to be 10 seconds. So that's exactly what is it. No single grain size should be too large. And the typical thing we do is, uh, you know, we assign eight objects or ten objects per processor, and it shouldn't be much more than ten times what we talked about the overhead. So you can be as close to the optimal green size without even thinking about when you go to larger scale what happens. And things like that. So yeah. just a quick note. Another way to think about this is when you're designing your application and setting up a run. Imagine that you have an infinite number of processors, and those processors are still connected by a network with, you know, high but finite bandwidth and latency. So you have a fast network, but it's not a magical network. Um, so as long as it's still worth doing a parallel decomposition across more processors with the workload you have then you should do it. You know, if you had blue team Taurus stretching out to infinity, but you know, there's still that distance, you know, how, whatever size problem you're running, you'll want to take, there's some chunk of the machine that's an optimal size. That's how many, gray, you know, that's how finally you want to break up individual jars. And then, if you happen to run it on a smaller machine, that means the runtime can efficiently attack them to load balance and do communication efficiently and so forth. And this work going on to automatically, you know, uh, this Yanwa's work on control system to automatically figure out what is the right grain size, et cetera, et cetera. So that will be coming later. So in this, in this Fibonacci example that you guys saw in a few slides back. How do we set a grain size here? So what, what was happening is each char is spawning new chars, and they are spawning new chars. And you can go on till you reach a very fine grain level, till, till you have only two numbers to find the Fibonacci. That's very tiny fine grain level. Right? So the way you would set the fine grain size here is in that example where you had um, if n less than 2, then respond with whatever number it is. You can decide that maybe after 4 or let's say 10, I'm not going to spawn new tasks because this, the 
the overhead that I'm going to incur in spawning the new task, I can also compute it sequentially and do it by myself in response to my pattern. So you stop this tree from propagating onto that very tiny fine green granularity. You stop the tree from ta forking your task at a certain point. In that, you will have to determine what is the right point. You don't want it to be too big, and you don't want it to be too small either. Yeah, that's what I have. Okay. Yeah. This is pop. Sorry, I think I'm not getting it. I, mean, I understand that if you have a giant grain size and you limit the computation because it has to go through. Yeah. I understand that there's overhead in sending messages. Yes. Um, I understand practically what your guidelines are saying. Yeah. Saying compared to the overhead per message. Yeah. But how do I know what the overhead? Well, that that that's why I said there's this alternative way you can think about it. Of you know, imagine you have an infinite number of processors. Break it up so that you can make the best use you can of every process. You know, imagine it's an MPI program with an infinite number of processors. Okay. And however you break it up, those processors will still have to communicate. So if you go too small, you know, you have a surface area, the volume ratio problem that your communication is going to be your entire data set all the time. So you, you know, dial it back just far enough that your communication doesn't overwhelm the computation. So you know what is alpha, beta, cost, the message latency, and how much message the bandwidth it's going to be to the calculation. And you find that it's x millisecond, let's say. You know that what is the speed of the processor. This is a way to involve calculation. You know what's the speed of the processor. So you can do so many calculations sequentially on your own thing instead of spawning the new task. That's one way to make it I think the, the, the question you have is uh, that new grammar, I think it, it depends. It depends on your network. It depends yeah, no, I mean, I, I understand the guidance, but it's very hard to know what the overhead per message is, right? Well, right. So that, that's why I'm trying to. Try to hear it. That, that's what, yeah. So ultimately, it, it'll have to come out of an empirical determination. But that's why, if you think about it, you, most parallel programmers have a better sense of how much communication is too much. And just think about it in terms of how far can I decompose before communication is overwhelming. So you guys, the two parameters you typically use are the latency, which means the time that they have to go from a NIC card to inside the process that can find some yeah. and then there's the, the network speed okay. size of your message. So in these analyses they ignore things like congestion. All of the I get an idea what we're so so just just to give you an example, suppose you were writing like a parallel matrix multiply in you know in any parallel thing on a distributed memory computer. You have you know, a huge number of processors and you know, a fixed size matrix. You're still not going to write something where each processor owns a single element of the matrix. You're going to have some block size that each processor, you know, you'll distribute the matrix over, you know, in blocks over that set of processors. Okay. Because that is what you will do. But then you will have to decide on the size of the block. You'll have to decide on the size You're of the block, and ultimately, the communication. Yeah. So ultimately, yes, the optimal block size is going to be, you know, empirically determined. But it's you know when you're designing the application, you can tell up front that v or that that block size is not one, because you have some intuition of what is or isn't efficient on a parallel computer. And you know that you can't make a matrix block size of one and have you know one floating point operation alongside sending a message, you know, receiving along a row, sending along column, whatever. So you know that there's going to be a trade-off there. So essentially, as long as you design and implement the application so that that block size is a parameter you can set, you know, when you start up the application. 
then you can tune that when you do runs. Yeah. Uh, will we have any more code examples? Uh, yeah, there's yeah, there's code examples kind of throughout all of this. I'm hoping to see an example which shows a parallel grid sort, for example, where you map its multiplication. Um, you have something like that. Yeah. Because in that case, you have to pack, pass back from your lower char to a main char or upper char, not just one single well, integer, we, but a piece of an array. Well, so we that actually. Would be more interesting. We, we showed a array argument passing in one of the earlier examples. Uh, the most complicated example we have is like in the uh, tutorials of the 3D Jacobi. Okay. Yeah. Lots yeah. of data. Uh, 3D Jacobi? Yeah, so it's a stencil code. It's a seven point stencil in three dimensions. So you have you know, a 3D, and then each element is going to pass planes of ghost cells from its boundaries. So it packs those into arrays and transmits those. Um, so that, that will be shown. Uh, do we have any more questions on the grain size stuff before we go on? OK, cool. So um, as we mentioned earlier, there's kind of this progression of uh, programming model characteristics from over decomposition to migratability and then adaptivity. Uh, so we've covered over decomposition at length. Just to give you the brief on migratability. So we have this mechanism in charm for object serialization, and actually general data serialization called PUC, which is the pack unpack framework. This is the way that we move objects around. It's actually also the way that we serialize arguments to entry methods. So um, essentially all it's doing is it's providing a way to take bits in memory you know, the way your program is going to operate on them, serialize them into bits that would go out onto the wire as, you know, a linear buffer, and then how do you convert them back to bits in memory that your program can operate on again. So for, for an object that's being migrated, there's kind of this life cycle that the object goes through where at initial construction, I've got the pointer, here we go. So at initial construction, you get your constructor call with you know, your standard arguments that you'd use to initialize the, arc, the, uh, the object. And then you know, it's going to go through this lifetime of methods being invoked. And then at some point, if you turn on load balancing or if you have a checkpoint happening, <coughs> then the runtime is going to go through the migration flow for this. So it's going to tell the object, it's going to call this virtual method about to migrate, and normally that doesn't actually need to do anything. Sometimes in really complicated applications, you might like release a reference to a cache value somewhere on your processor or things like that. Then it will size the application, so it will figure out how much data there is to be serialized. It will allocate a buffer for that pack the data into that buffer, and then it will call the, if it's actually migrating the object rather than just checkpointing it, it'll call the destructor. And then on the receiving side, if an object is being, is immigrating to a processor or is being restored from a checkpoint, then that's where that CK migrate message constructor gets called. So that is essentially a dummy constructor that doesn't need to do anything because anything it initializes is immediately going to be overwritten in the unpack from the serialized data. So you get that migration constructor, constructor which you do as little as possible because we're going to unpack over anything that it wrote. And then there's this separate call to say, OK, I've finished unpacking you. If you need to do anything to move into your new home, you know, pick up local references to other objects or things like that. You can do that there. So the way this works, here is just an example char with some elements in it, you know, with some members in it, you know, an in to float a character and an array of a few more floats. So the way the pub framework works is for char classes, 
because we have some of this runtime generated state that needs to travel with the object, we have to tell we have to tell that inherited state, yes, pack yourself up as well. Uh, we're working on things to eliminate that, but the implementation's kind of complex. And then for each of the individual members, we have this puffer object that the runtime system is going to pass in. And we just pass each of those members into it. And we use the pipe symbol here kind of to be reminiscent of like the pipe in a shell script that it, you're just pushing data through a pipeline. Um, for objects that are not, you know, that are non-scalar, so like this array, we pass the array and the size of it, and this is overloaded for you know any type that it knows how to serialize, so it can pick up the entire the entire uh, vector of data rather than just one element. And these pub methods can be defined for chars. If you have your own data types that you want to pass in arguments, again, you can just pick them up and use them automatically. Sorry, just to be clear, yeah. if you want to have migratability, you have to write a pub. Yes, if you want, if you want to have user stuff. Yes, if you want migratability, you have to write a pub for the things to be migrated. You can't screw it up. Well, no, 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 no. Glad, I mean that the other way around. If if you get the pup wrong, funny things will happen. Yes, yes. So, um, funny, scary, confusing, all sorts of terrible things can happen. Um, so yes, they look simple, but it's some place where we don't really have a good way to error check. We can. We don't have you know, a nice mechanism to say, oh, you got that wrong, you're missing something, <clears throat> things are inconsistent. Do you have to send everything in the object, or can you select? You can, you can select. But if you select wrong, it would be sorry. Well, yeah, so, <laughs> so if your objects are only migrating at particular points in their life cycle, mm -hmm. where you know, the object might have transient state, but at the migration points, that transient state is dead, then yes, you would want to leave out that transient state from what you serialize. Is there a way just to say, hey, treat this as a bag of bytes. I've got a homogeneous yes. processor. Just ship it. I don't care. You're not yep. going to screw it up. Yes, there is. There is a method, uh, or there is a declaration puff bytes. Oh, good. That just says, treat this object as a bag of bytes. Mm. Serialize it. You know, size of from beginning to end, and it's fine. Good. We'll call it. That's it. So yes. that's the screw up there. Well, that, that's, that doesn't work for chars specifically because you have to deal with the base class <laughs> object, unfortunately. Uh, so like so you, could, you could pop a whole tree then. Like if you had a complex data structure inside. Yeah. Could... Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I believe mm. our slightly deeper example has exactly that kind of thing. OK. Um, so. I think we have utility classes that make this easier. They haven't made it into our tutorial material. But essentially, so what we have is we have some variable array of a given size of floats. So in our pup routine, we pack or unpack the size deterministically. And then we say, OK, if we're on the unpacking end, then we need to actually allocate memory for to un, you know, space in which to unpack the data that we're receiving. So then, regardless of which direction we're going packing or unpacking, we want to actually pack the contents of that array, so the pointer to it and its size. And then for this other thing, which we're just going to have either one instance of or none, we look at whether it's a null pointer, pack up that Boolean flag, and if it's not null, and we're in the unpacking case, meaning that we have to uh, deallocate it, or we have to allocate it, then we allocate the new instance on the receiving side, and then pack or unpack the contents. So the you vertical part packs or unpacks? Mm -hmm. Sorry, what was the question? Well, the vertical, the pipe or yes. thing, it sort of knows. Yeah. It's so the, the the puffer object itself knows which direction it's going, whether it's packing or unpacking. So the idea in this is that 
hot methods should mostly be uniform, and in particular, they need to have the same sequence of objects being packed or unpacked, so that you know you end up with the right right bits of the buffer <coughs> ending up in the right fields of the object. So do we have to take care? Of, so if we migrate the char, mm -hmm. we do the class. Do we have to? Do we delete our local instance, or does the whole char? So, so when a char is migrated off a of processor, the runtime system will call the lead on that char. Okay. And so the destructor should then do that deallocation. Okay. So that that's why you don't see any deletes in the packing code. <laughs> So, as mentioned before, if you get the pup wrong, you know, say you've added a new, Can you go new field. Up? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you, 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 in this case, let's say you're unpacking. Yeah. So you get the heap array size of the vertical bar. Yep. And further below, you call it with the size and the array. Meaning here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yet, this thing, yeah, and it knows it's unpacking. Yeah, but it cannot do the, the allocation for you internally. Um, so it doesn't necessarily know how you want it allocated. You might decide, you might have a special heap that you want to put it on. You might have a buffer someplace else. So it's... It's being more flexible. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so it requires the programmer to be more explicit about it, but it means that if you do something different from, like, the very basic thing is not going to step on your toes. So, as noted, if you're adding or removing, you know, typically it's only a problem with adding because if you remove a member, the compiler will, er will error on the missing field. But if you add stuff, we don't really have a good way to say you missed something. Um, Keep in mind that this is essentially all passed by value. So if you have you know, a recursive structure on the heap, you need to actually go through it recursively. If you imp implement the pub methods nicely, they should kind of do that recursion naturally. Um, yeah, you see in the memory allocation on unpacking, you have to make sure, because the same framework is doing sizing, packing, and unpacking, you have to make sure that all the variables get touched consistently. That's why we have things like flags. And typically, when you want to test your application to see whether object migration is behaving sensibly or not, we have this special load balancer rotate LB. What that will do is it will take every object on every processor and shift them cyclically to the next processor in the job so that every object migrates every time that's invoked. Also use random. Yeah, then there's also a randomizing load balancer that'll just kind of shuffle things, but it's less certain to migrate. You know, if you have something that only shows up with like an un uninitialized value or something like that, you're you know you're lowering your probability. Yeah, it's, it's, still it's, on it's easier to predict. Right? You know yeah. that if something where things are should be after the yeah. there are <laughs> you can tell it not to migrate your char under any circumstances. Yes. Yeah, so if if you have a char that shouldn't migrate, you can set a flag say, in the char saying, this isn't migratable, either right now or ever, and the runtime will respect that. <coughs> Sorry, did you show us the sizing? Um, it's, it's the same code. Popper, a popper is polymorphic. The runtime will pass a sizing popper first, which will examine everything, but it won't actually touch the data. It'll just you know, sum up the size of everything that it was passed. <laughs> then the runtime will see, OK, I finished sizing it. What was the total at the end? Allocate that buffer you know, inside a packing puffer, or give it to a packing puffer. Then it will do the same thing packing into that buffer that was just allocated. So that, that's one of the niceties of this framework, that you write one piece of code for every step of the serialization, deserialization process. Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. OK. 
So just as an application of this, without getting into any of the deeper runtime system stuff, once you have objects that can migrate, the runtime system can implement fault tolerance for you automatically. So there are uh, four different approaches and with some sub-variations within these of how the runtime system can do automatic fault tolerance. So the most straightforward and the one that we're going to discuss you know, details of is disk-based checkpoint restart. So that's the same as if you know, your application code were to write out manual checkpoint files. And this you know, saves you from whole machine failures, end of job, you know, timeout, whatever. There are also online fault tolerance mechanisms that we're not going to go into detail on. But just know that they exist if you want to experiment with them or if you want to convince data center operators that they should not kill jobs when a node goes down so that you can take advantage of this, that would be great. But the common feature of all of these is that checkpointing is a single function call that's essentially transparent to the application logic. Um, they all leverage the object migration capability. Once you know how to put an object on the wire, you know how to put it in a file as well. Um, and they can be used in concert with load balancing as well. So just for the simple checkpoint to file system case, you know, imagine you have an you know, a job allocation that gives you five hours of execution time, and you know that your total simulation is going to take much more than five hours. Maybe it takes a week. Uh, so all you need to do is add some regular interval during your run, or now on Blue Waters, they're actually adding a signal mechanism to say your job ends in 15 minutes, and it's possible actually to submit killable jobs on Blue Waters. So it will tell you, I'm going to kill you in 15 minutes because I want your nodes back. You can trigger a checkpoint. And what this will do is it will migrate all of the chars to a buffer that will end up in files on the persistent file system. So on the NFS, Luster, GPFS, whatever system. Um, so you find a convenient synchronization point in your application. You quiet down all the work. You set up a callback for what to do when you resume from this checkpoint, either as execution continues or when you restart. And you say checkpoint to files in a directory with this name. And so then when you're running, when you want to restart, you start your program as normal, and then you add this extra runtime flag plus restart. And this log here is a placeholder. So since we were asked to call that out. So that is the name of whatever directory you stuck the checkpoint in. You say, my checkpoint files are in that directory. Resume execution from wherever that left off. And one neat feature of this is that Charm++ can actually resume on different numbers of processors than you checkpointed on. So there's no constraint of, there's no runtime level constraint of, you know, I was running it on 2,000 processors before. I need to get an allocation of exactly that many when I resume. If you see, oh, hey, there's, you know, 1,900 processors available right now in backfill for the next eight hours, you just grab them and, you know, start running immediately rather than having to wait in the queue for a bigger slice. Does the checkpoint work on, on blue chain queue as well? Yeah. Yeah, so this is this this style of checkpoint is architecture independent. Okay. It works everywhere. As long as you have a file system to put it on. That that's the only dependence. It's one file. It's a direct it's yeah, it's one file per per PE. Per PE, okay. Or actually, well it's per node or core or it's it's a little bit more than one file per PE because we have arrays and other runtime structures as well, but oh, the goal. Yeah, but the, it, it's self-contained in this directory, mm -hmm. and it's something Sorry, I have to run. Have your flight to catch. Yeah. Okay. Well, have a it's safe really trip. Helpful. Thank you for coming. Send you an email with the yeah. puzzle. Right. So um, that that will be extended for when machines have flash memory and things like this. Yeah. So we have yeah we have very so another important point here is. We can optimize this in the runtime system 
for any kind of development, so architecture-wise, file system-wise, whatever, and the application logic is still just makes this function call. That's one of the good things of learning all the syntax. You get the good. Yeah. So, like, what do you have to do as a programmer? I mean, like, the, the, the say hello, I mean, what is, is it any? What is that? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, oh, we, yeah, we kind of elided this. So, essentially, this is just saying, the same way we had reduction targets earlier, this is just saying, find the hello method, for, or the, the say hi method, rather, of the hello char class, and invoke that on hello proxy after you resume. So, so if, if this were, if there were no callback here, yep. the way the application should be written, or effectively would be written, is you would write a tech point and then it would just hang. You know, there would be nothing happening after it, because the application needs to be quiet. Yeah, after the tech point, where do we go? Right? If, if I'm running and I'm making a tech point, I need to do something after it. Yeah. yeah, where does Call execution continue? What to do next? Similarly, when you resume from the checkpoint, you're going point, the same place. Right? You just keep cranking along where you were. No? Oh, but no. So that, but at the end of the checkpoint, you, you need to you need to restart. You need to, to kick things off, right? Because what you've done is keep going. you've stored the control flow up to the making of the checkpoint. Right? <coughs> you haven't stored what happens next because that hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> yeah. So imagine. So start from. Sorry, I'm so, not getting. Well, wait, Eric. Yeah. So start from your checkpointing and your job is stopping right there. So consider the restart case. Yes. So after you've restarted, there are no messages in the queues. Yes. The system is completely idle. So you need to tell the runtime system, what do I do after restart to resume execution? To, to crank the engine back up, right? You didn't write all the messages in the queue? No, no, so that, that's what I'm saying. When you reach this point, you should have no messages. Oh. Because you, oh. need, you need to create a coordinated checkpoint. So you need a consistent state. So if there are arbitrary messages in queues, you're going to get some jumble. <coughs> so I'm pretty sure we do, in fact, checkpoint queued messages, but it will be unpleasant for the developer to have to account for checkpointing in kind of arbitrary conditions. So I, I, I'm, I still don't get it. So, so you imagine you, you get to the end of a time step or an iteration in your calculation. Okay. You say, OK, everything. It's like an MPI barrier. Everybody's yeah. just like, stop. Yes, everyone stopped. You know exactly what state everything is in. Yeah. So you say, that is the state that I'm going to checkpoint. Okay. Usually, you and then, do something like you call a reduction. Yeah, no, okay, I understand and then that. When the reduction is done, and everybody's sort of in the same state, and then you say, I see. So this is a, this is a, what the it's heck? not arbitrarily flexible. Um, you can't be like, we're going to checkpoint now in the middle of this giant communication. The other checkpoint mechanisms do, I believe, support doing that. Like the, the more sophisticated researchy ones. Why did this lose? <laughs> My external screen. What? I think, I think the projector came off. This happened really again. What? Um, Why is that? <laughs> right, except that it's not going to come back on quickly. Oh, it's going to slide Yeah, because it might have gotten hot. Why is the projector turning itself off arbitrarily? Send emails to support. Okay, I, I, I think I understand this kind of technology where you really finish a cycle yeah, and before the next cycle. Yeah, checkpoint, and then so you have to start the next cycle. Yeah, so that, that callback is just saying, what message do I send to whom yeah. to start the next cycle yeah. after you resume from the checkpoint? But I can't checkpoint in the middle of everything. You shouldn't. You don't want to. It's hard, OK. Yeah. It, it will be a stickier process. OK. Is this going to come back on now? But theoretically, it's possible, because char++ is just message driven. Yeah. Right. So that we'll just so we're sending the messages and get going. After yeah. Right. So there, so the in-memory checkpointing scheme has a mechanism to transparently produce what's called a distributed snapshot, 
which says, here are the set of messages before the snapshot, here are the messages after it. The snapshot is the state at exactly between those messages. And, and then everything else after that is, you know, queued and stored as in-flight messages. So you can't do an asynchronous checkpoint? Yes. It, we have, that's more experimental code. So we're, we're less confident of the stability of it, so we don't want to encourage new users to just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go use that, because they, we don't want to disappoint people. You know, under promise, over deliver. This checkpoint mechanism works. What? Thank you. Thank you for explaining all of this. Yeah. Um, what? It's, 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 it's overheated. Okay. Oh, no, no it's yeah, up. It's, still, it's just going from, it's rebooting. It's, it's rebooting. Yeah, but normally, okay, okay. well, computer. Normally for it to come off is faster than this, too, so. No computer. Yeah, no, it's got it. Yeah, setting up image. Yes, we're back. Okay. Uh, so I'll note that we are a half hour from the end of our allotted slot, and we're like halfway through <laughs> the slides. So, uh, which... Do you have another room? I mean, we've probably got the room for as long as we need, but it's just a matter of like when people need to start heading for meetings or airplanes or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Who has to yeah. leave? Who has to leave after two? Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. And who has to leave after one? Yeah. Do you have to one? <laughs> well, that's one way to do it. I don't know whether any of you had meetings or other stuff scheduled. Before. Lunch, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah but we we've got food one. here, sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go so for another hour. Maybe you want to cook. <laughs> yeah. Cook can think. Pizza. Yeah, I mean, we can we can probably get through some of this fairly quickly. Do you want to pick up yeah, on exactly. Nastag? Okay. Um, cool. Move swiftly. Yeah. Well, at least try. Yeah. Yeah, the, the amount of material is, is ambitious for four hours. Even though Sanjay and I and Mikhail talk really fast for seven years. Well, I mean, it might have been a big <laughs> enough group that people didn't ask questions also. I don't know how big it was. It was larger. You know. yeah. yeah. So, as we've mentioned a bunch of times before, the execution in Char++ is asynchronous. So you don't have any sort of guarantees on when messages will arrive and which order they'll be executed, which helps for efficiency, but sometimes it makes things difficult to understand program. For example, before we saw that example where we sent 10 messages and the last one was supposed to end computation. However, if that one got there first, we can miss out on a bunch of computation. So structured dagger is a construct in Charm++ that kind of, uh, it basically easily allows the programmer to sort of uh, restrict control flow to a pattern they may find more desirable or necessary in cases. Um, so again, so far, a char is a reactive entity. So it simply waits for a message, and then as soon as it gets a message, whatever that message happens to be, it executes it, you know, regardless of whether the programmer wanted something else to execute first. Um, so basically, another way of expressing the life cycle of a char is um, some chars might we we might want to keep truly reactive. So any message they receive, they respond to it at any time, and that's what we want. However, sometimes we want a certain order, or certain things will have to happen in a certain order. So you might need to complete one part of the computation before the next part can can carry on. And modeling this is possible without SDAG. However, SDAG is meant to make it easier. So in this case, we, in one computation, depend on remote invocation and completion of other computation, we can model it using a DAG, or a directed acyclic graph. And we have the functionality in Charm to sort of encode that into the chars themselves. So we're going to go back to the Fibonacci example before, uh, as we had before. And if you remember, each parent had two children it was waiting on. And once it got the results from both of those children, it would know its, its result of the subproblem and could then in turn respond to its parents. So we kind of had this weird extra control flow in the respond message where we had to keep count of how many responses we've had. And then once we've received the two responses we were waiting for, then we know, OK, we've got our final results, and we can send that back. And even for this rather simple case, it was a little bit of extra mechanism that we would like to hide 
and allow the programmer to make things a little more clear. So in this case, again, we have the same CI file. We just have our uh, Fibonacci constructor, where again, it takes the number it's computing, whether or not it's the root and the location of some results. And we have our entry method for responding with a value. And now we're going to define this in terms of Let's see. Who's it the original? Oh, this is, yes, this is the original. So again, here we have this, when we get a respond message, when we receive a value from one of our children, we explicitly need to go and say, okay, have, have we actually gotten all of our children's responses? Then we can continue. And again, this is a very simple example. You can imagine when there's much more things you're waiting on. For example, if you're doing a 3D Jacoby and you need to wait on responses from all six of your neighbors, this is just going to get messier and messier and involve you to write a bunch of basically code that does, does this kind of stuff. So if we consider the Fibonacci char, um, if it's not a leaf, it creates two children, and when both children return results, it can compute its own result and send it up. Um, this logic is hidden in flags and counters, but essentially the key here is that every Fibonacci chart has the same communication pattern. Create two chars, wait for two responses, send your own message. So this, it has like this template of, of the communication pattern it's supposed to have. So what we want to do is kind of capture this at a higher level in the code so that's easier to read, easier to code, easier to understand. Um, so the little notational support, for example, uh, we introduced structured dagger. So structured dagger adds some additional constructs to the CI file. So when we're defining these entry methods that chars can respond to, we now have some additional constructs. The first one we're going to introduce is the when construct. Um, so the when construct basically says uh, what a char will do when it receives a message. Um, so it declares the actions to perform when the message is received. Um, and then in sequence, it acts like a block and receive. So for, in this case, we see we have some method um, defined. And the body of that method is saying, when we receive entry method one with whatever parameters, we'll execute block two. And when we receive entry method two for some parameters, uh, we'll execute block three. Now these are sequenced, so if we receive entry method two before we receive entry method one, this message is just going to get buffered uh, at the char and we'll wait to actually execute it until after we've done what needs to come first. So we're giving this explicit ordering that's easy to look at. You can look at this code and say, okay, first we're going to execute entry method one, do whatever it does here, and then move on to entry method two. So unlike before, where we'd have unordered sends, and we didn't really know what order they would be executed in, now we can sort of constrain the ordering of events. So I, this is a method inside of the class. But yeah, the this, is, this is actually going to be in the CI file. So this is an entry method, uh, some, some entry method. So we can invoke this on a char remotely, as we normally would. And basically, the body of this says, OK, first wait to make sure you have an entry method one message. When you have that message, entry method. right? When you have this message, so when when there exists a message in the in the queue that matches this pattern, basically, then we can go ahead and execute some chunk of code, and then again wait until you have something that matches entry method two with these parameters, and then execute the next block of code. Um, so the serial construct is another structured dagger construct. This just executes a serial block of C++ code in the CI file. Um, is the SDAG Fibonacci thing in the code tutorial examples? Yes. OK, what's the name so people can look at it? Uh, fib SDAG. OK. Yeah, so, so there's. You want to look at it while you're explaining. Yes, there is a larger. So we're going to build towards basically converting the SDAG, or sorry, the Fibonacci example from using this explicit buffering of messages to um, using SDAG. So that example's in the repository. We'll be getting that on the slides, but if you want to take a look at it now, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so the serial construct just says execute this block of code. Um, it'll be executed without interruption, preemption, just like the body of any other entry method. Uh, the syntax is just serial, followed by some optional string, and then the C++ code, C++ code you want executed. Um, the optional string is just there. For example, if uh, we've seen examples of uh, projections plots before, and in projections plots, it tells you uh, each each uh, different colored block, and there usually corresponds to an entry method, telling you you know where time is spent. So now you can also label these serial blocks so you can see how much time is spent in each of these. Um, 
And then serial blocks are just, they can access any members of the class they belong to, just like any other serial block of code in that class. So for example, here we have uh, entry method one, or sorry, method one has some parameters and its body is just a serial block that will first invoke a method on this proxy and then call some function. Here we have another example where we've given an explicit uh, name to this serial block. Uh, but the key thing to note here is that these uh, methods right here, as they're defined right here, will behave exactly like uh, methods in charm plus plus already behave. So when you receive uh, a method one uh, invocation, in serial just uh, send a message, call a function, or over here set a value. Um, so where we really get the power of SDAG is when we combine these serial blocks with the uh, when construct. So going back to this sum method, we can get the sequencing we're looking for by Okay, some method is invoked. The first thing we'll do is implement, or sorry, execute this serial block of code, block skew block one. Then we'll wait for the arrival of entry method one. As soon as entry method one actually is arrived and invoked, in serial we'll execute this block two, whatever code that might be. It could be any block of C++ code. And then finally we'll wait for entry method two. Once that arrives, execute block three. Sorry. Um. So you call some method. Right, so when this sum method... It does block one, and then it just sits there. Right. Waiting for someone to call entry method one mm -hmm. and complete entry method one. And then it will do this. So one. and this is essentially the, the definition of entry method one. It now treats entry method one as a message. When it sees that message, this is the code it executes. Usually there'll be some data. So some char. I, I think there. my question is far simpler. Like entry method one is some other method declared somewhere else. No, it's declared right there. It's, it's not, no, no, no. It's, it's a very valid question. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but the name doesn't exactly. Uh, block two is not the entry method to code, right? Right. It is pretty much acts in this case as if it's entry method uh, one's code, right? And block two is entry method one's code is what it appears like. But in fact, entry method one's code is deep inside the bowels of this uh, structured language system. It automatically generates the code. All that you do is somewhere else in your program, you declare, uh, in, in, in the declaration of that object in the .ci file, you put entry method one parameters semicolon for the declaration of it. Yeah. So you are giving away the right to write the code for that method to the structured language runtime system. And all that you're saying is, this is saying is, because it could be when entry method one comma entry method five serial block two, right? Right. All that I'm saying is follow this sequence that I'm giving you. I don't know if that answered your question. No, my no, question I'm... is much more elementary. Okay. My right. question is, like, go to the next slide. Yeah, it might help when we actually see the. What does that even mean? Wait for entry to arrive. Like, this is just some other method. Like, you're hanging there waiting for some other guy. To well, so I mean, imagine. So like, no, 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 no. it's not anyone else speaking. Go ahead. Yeah. So imagine that any entry method, SDAG or not, is essentially a receive operation by that chart for a particular kind of message that matches that method. Yes. So normally those receive operations are a wild card for the whole object. And they're going to, you know, the runtime system is just going to pick one and give you a message yep. that fires one off. This says, for this particular kind of method, I'm going to post blocking receipts for that method. And the only time I want to execute something that accepts one of those messages is when I see a block of code like this that says, when I get this message, do stuff. And correspondingly, if you see that, or when the runtime system sees that, if it doesn't have a message, that means the object's control flow is blocked. So it's just going to return to the scheduler and stop execution at that point. Okay, so it's going to, you call some method, you execute block one, and at that point, you're in control to the schedule. You know, 
the it controls with the scheduler, but it remembers that you were here. Yeah. Yes. But then some other entry method in some other place on some other char gets called called entry method one. No, no, no. Something so calls that on this on object. You. Somebody invokes that on you. Well, oh, so there's another entry method in the same char. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. they sent you a me they sent you a message. It's called entry method one. one. It's not called some method, right? Yeah, yeah, something calls entry method one on this chart. Sure. And it executes entry method one, it completes it. It executes this code. It executes the code right here. Oh. This is the implementation of entry method one. Yeah, it, ah, it so might become a little more clear okay. when we Thank see the you. whole file. But basically, this chart has, as far as we can tell, three methods that can be called on it. A, a chart can send it a sub method, or it can call sub method on it, entry method one, entry method two. This is just saying, OK, if we get entry method one you know, somewhere out here, we're not going to execute that. But if we get some method, we'll start here, execute this, and we'll wait for this message to be available, then we'll wait for this message to be available. So if I call entry method one before some method, I wouldn't have to do it again. It would yeah, it's right. It'll just end up buffered saying, I, I can't execute this time. Just semantically, was it yeah. comprehensible to me? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, so a little more on the when construct. So again, you have these uh, when constructs saying what method you're expecting, what parameters it's going to receive, and then it'll execute whatever's after that. Um, you can also uh, essentially chain these together. So if you're saying, I, I don't want to move forward until I receive both uh, my method one and my method two, uh, you can just have when followed by a comma. So now the runtime system, when it receives method one, if it still doesn't receive method two, it'll still re return control to the scheduler. And then once basically all of these dependencies are satisfied, then it will say, OK, I have all the methods I need. I can continue with whatever I was supposed to continue. Uh, which, again, is just the same as you know when my method one is called, again, wait for my method two. Oh, actually, there is okay. There's a typo on there. Um, that further code in the third thing should be inside the inner braces. Uh, yes, and that's important because that's the lexical scope. Yeah. Param 1, param 2, and param 3 are actually in scope inside those braces, the same as they are inside further code in the second listing. <clears throat> and presumably, if you were waiting on those methods to be executed, then it's because you were dependent on the data that they contained. And instead of further S tag in the comments, it should be further code. Uh, yes. So let's see. Oh, yeah, so a structured dagger can be used in any normal entry method, uh, excluding a constructor. It can be used on a main char, a char, or an array. And then there's just a little bit of extra you need to add when you have a structured dagger code. Um, so again, this is going to be in the CI file. So code for this structured dagger stuff is going to be generated by the uh, charm C uh, translator. Um, it'll generate a macro that you need to include in your actual C++ file, so it knows what extra code to include there. And it also adds a little bit extra to the pup method. You need to also call stag pup. So any stag state information and stuff like that can be pupped as well. Uh, so now, yeah, OK, so this is an example. Again, just here's what the CI file would look like. If it has some entry method with a body, then we have structured dagger code here. In the CPP file, we just need to make sure to put this at the top so it knows to include any stag code. OK. Um, and just be put back for just a second, since we said we'll call out placeholders. So the name of that macro has the class name yeah. for the corresponding class stuck onto it. Yep. So in this case, the class name and char is declared as my foo, so it's my foo underscore as the end code. OK, so now we can actually get to a concrete. This is the Fibonacci example. Again, it's in the, the code director the directory. So in this case, uh, we have the constructor, which doesn't do anything special, so that's going to be defined in the CPP file as well as before. And now we have this sort of uh, driving uh, calc method uh, in the STAG portion. So in calc, we receive you know, what Fibonacci number are we supposed to calculate, n, if n is less than our threshold. So this actually also ties in some of the grain size stuff, harsh to mention. If n is less than some threshold, then in serial, we'll just uh, compute the Fibonacci sequentially and respond with that. Otherwise, in serial, we will create our two children chars. And then after we create them, then we just wait for two responses. So we wait for some response that will send us a value and some response that will send us another value. 
And once we've received those two, we can respond to our parent with uh, the sum of those values. Can you explain like why, what, like in the threshold line, n minus less than threshold? Mm -hmm. What does that serial do for me? Um, uh, how does it modify anything? I mean, I don't know. So, so respond is actually going to be just some other uh, method that is defined on the Fibonacci class, which we'll look at shortly. Yeah. So is sequential Fibonacci. So all this is saying is uh, call this sequential Fibonacci function with n, since we don't want to continue recursing too far, um, and pass whatever result you get. So respond is just the method, as we see, that just sends the, your result to your parent. So here we're saying our result can be computed sequentially and take that result and respond or send that to our parent. If we're not below threshold, then our result is going to be computed basically by our children. So we create two children. When we receive both responses, now we respond with our parent instead of with the sequential computation, just with the sum of the two subproblems that were solved by our children. What does the word serial do in this context? That if it wasn't there, it would do something different. It's, it's a signal to the parser that everything in the following yeah. block is C++ code and not ASCII. Yeah. Um, we don't. Okay. Parsing in C++ is hideously okay. painful, and no one gets it right, so we don't try. Yeah. Okay. So, so serial is. I see. Yeah. And again, this is sort of. I mean, this might be sort of related to your previous questions. Here is also we're saying that the this Fibonacci class it has a calc entry method. And it has this response entry method. It just so happens that the response is used in the SDAG code. So the response entry method takes some int, and when it's called, you know, if we're ready for a response, it'll trigger these one blocks. Now, if that wasn't in serial, and there was some parallelism to take advantage of, Charm would have exploited that. Um, <coughs> which, which part? Like the respond, or the, or sorry, if there, if there had been several lines of something, like either, <clears throat> like multiple responds, um, those could have gone in parallel or something. So or? At, at this level of sophistication, there is no intrachar parallelism. It does not exist. Oh, okay. Charms yeah. are sequential objects. Okay. So this, um, so this, so the serial just really just the serial really is just a signal to the parser. Yeah, it's just saying okay. execute this block of code sequentially as you would any other block of oh, C++ code. Yeah. And eventually, you may add a parallel block. Not like well. So there is a separate construct overlap, which is coming up. I think. Okay. Which says you know there is multiple things that might block interleave them. You know, but but even then, the semant the execution semantics are still sequential within within the char. Yeah, only one still, of those would be executing at a time. It goes back to like the original semantics of our entry methods. We want those to execute. When we are executing entry method, we want that to be the only thing we're executing sequentially from start to finish without preemption, because that's our, our basic unit of computation. Oh, without preemption. Right. Got so this is, this is the same type of thing. When it hits a serial block, this char is going to be executing until it finishes that serial block. Then it might be. It could go and do just giving up control of the runner. Yeah, then it'll give like control back to the scheduler. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, so you, you can write that code with full confidence, but it doesn't need to react. Ah, OK. <laughs> All right. So I can declare static something or other, and all those bad things that you shouldn't do. For In the previous examples of code lines, like the real class methods were in the C file or C++ file. Now right. they're migrating into the CI file. Yes. So in general, yeah, the, basically the SDAG is going to model the control flow, and that's going to stay in the CI file. And then the implementation of the guts sort of will usually still end up being in the CPP file. So like we don't have the actual definition for sequential Fibonacci and respond here. Those are going to be the CPP file or the C file, which we'll look at next. Uh, this really just is to lay out the control flow in an easier to read way. In the previous uh, example, it wasn't actually clear why. Okay, uh, why did you create two new children? When are you going to respond to your parent? What's the deal there? Here it's very explicit. You either respond right away, or you you know, create two children and wait for them to respond, and then respond to your parent in turn. You know, that's a, that's a stylistic choice. We are recommending that you keep the code here in the CI file to the control flow and call a function which does the, the, the guts and elsewhere. You yeah. could actually put any arbitrary amount of C code there. Yeah, yeah. that's what. 
Yeah, the idea is it's it's especially as you get more complicated examples, it's nice to be able to look at the CI file from a high level and say, okay, this is these are the steps my code is going to take in this order with this control flow, and then we need to know the guts of, for example, sequential Fibonacci responded. You know, those are even more complex. Then you go and look at the C file and see what the actual implementations of those things are. Because you know, like something like open app, yeah. flow of control is no it just you have to read the code to know the flow. And yeah. so we're it's been working at that. Yeah. So that's not true. I tried some of these RTH files to, that sort of did that. That was what was available. Started. And I think this is good because otherwise you give the code to a physics postdoc. And then, like, main ends. <laughs> <laughs> what happens <laughs> And then, so yeah, here we have the, the associated CPP file, which again is in the code directory, and you can uh, compile and run this. But here it just includes basically the, the basic units of, of computation here in the Fibonacci class are how, you know, once you reach the threshold, how do you actually just sequentially compute uh, Fibonacci. This is just done recursively. Uh, so to compute n, you compute n minus 1 and n minus 2. And the respond is just, if I'm the root, uh, or sorry, if I'm not the root, I'll respond with my value to my parent, as I was supposed to, and delete myself. Otherwise, if I'm the root, it's the end of the computation. I spit out what the Fibonacci number is, and then I exit. Um, so here we don't. So we take basically all the control flow that was implicit in the original example, pull that out, make it very explicit in the CI file, and then all that's remaining here is sort of these atomic units of, okay, how do you respond? How do you compute a sequential Fibonacci? So the untrained guy calling C fib with n minus one looks like a function call, but it's actually a char invocation. You know, so this is this is this is a function call. This is just a regular C method. Especially if like if you look at the CI file, the only entry methods for the fib char are calc and response. So everything here, these are just local methods. They're just like any other uh, method for a uh, plain C++ object. Oh, I see. So only two children are created, n, whatever, n yes. minus 1, n minus 2, and each one of them just does a local computation. To a point. Basically, so this goes back to the grain size thing. So when you start at the root, if, if the n is high enough, you'll create two children. Each of them will create two new children. Eventually, they're going to get to a point where they say it's just silly to keep creating more children because the computation is getting very, very, very fine-grained. So at that point, then they'll take over and do the sequential computation. Uh, for example, if the threshold was 5 and you wanted to compute the Fibonacci of 10, you would have chars for 9, 8, 7, 6, and 5, but then the 5 char would take care of actually computing the Fibonacci of 5 just sequentially like you, you normally would in just any other C++ code. It looks like you have a code duplication here. You put the parallel logic on this. Also, oh, you're never going to call. Are you ever going to call seek fit with n less than larger than two? Because yeah, it keeps spawning children. The threshold is ten. Yeah. So in this case, we've defined the threshold to be ten. And if you look at the control flow, we only if if n is less than threshold. So if n is nine, eight, seven, etc., that's where we'll call this. Oh. Uh, sequential Fibonacci and actually do the computation there and respond. Otherwise, we'll create children. So it's either you've reached the threshold and you do the rest of the computation okay. yourself you. or create children. And yes, there is that duplication between the sequential and parallel code. So is there a way to get rid of this duplication so that the compiler could compute your sequential we have or chart from the parallel one? So for sophisticated applications, we have a framework that uses recursive char construction for, I think, state space search applications, um, where you give it the logic once, and it synthesizes both versions. Um, but for the most part, this kind of thing doesn't actually come up in real applications. So this is it's an example code just to show the mechanisms. It's not something you would actually do. So you won't have such. OK, so back to the when construct. We can use this for more complex sequencing. Uh, the Fibonacci example was very straightforward. Uh, wait for two messages, respond to your parent. Uh, in this case, we have a much more complicated sequencing. Uh, here we wait for method one to happen. 
and then we need to wait for both method two and method three before we continue, and then after that, we again wait for method four. So you can basically define these arbitrary orderings of waiting for methods, blocking until you receive them, doing the correct computation, and then moving on with whatever you're supposed to continue doing. So again, this just goes through what I just said. You wait, uh, and then once you receive the messages, you continue. Um, so again, here, if method four arrives first, the method will just be buffered uh, by the runtime system, and then only when it's ready to be executed will it actually be called. Uh, we can also use when to wait for reference numbers and get even more complex with the when. Um, so for example, here if we're doing something uh, where the first parameter of our method is an integer. We can say, OK, we specifically want to wait for this method call where the first parameter is integer. So then here uh, we do the serial block and send it two invocations of method one. The first one doesn't match the when, so it won't be executed. And this one uh, does match, so it will be executed. So you can do this, for example, to um, make sure iterations happen in the correct order. If you pass the iteration number as the reference number, then you make sure that if you have information for iteration two and three, you'll, you'll do iteration two first, for example. Uh, it also provides a, a lot of control flow concept, a construct that you'll see in C. So you can have if then else on the in the S tag code. So if in this case, if we're the tenth or the eleventh uh, char in the array, we'll wait for this method. Otherwise, we'll actually wait for a different method. So you can actually change. So you can have the control flow dependent on you know fields in the char itself. Similarly, you can have for loops. So for example, here we're doing a, a bunch of iterations in what looks probably like a, a one-dimensional stencil code. So in every iteration, we're going to wait till we receive the left. Then we'll compute whatever we had to do with the left data, wait to receive the right data, do whatever computation we need there, and then go to the next iteration. And here again, here we see this uh, message is tagged by the iteration number. So if, for whatever reason, the guy to my, my left gets too far ahead and he ends up sending me information from an iteration that I'm not at yet, it won't match this message. So you, you will just wait for the left from your particular iteration, compute it, write, compute it, go to the next iteration. So it makes it very explicit what the computation flow is supposed to look like, and then the actual guts of the computation, you would usually, again, you could put them all here in straight line C code, or what we suggest is making it uh, just a separate function you call. Um, Is the for construct blocking for each iteration? Uh, the construct itself isn't necessarily blocking. What causes it to block is these whens. Um, so it'll enter the first iteration, and then again, if there's no message here that it's if it's expecting this receive left message and it's not there, it's going to return control to the scheduler. And once this message arrives, then it'll wake this char. This will enforce strictly. You do left, right, or zero before you do yep. one. Mm -hmm. Uh, similarly, we have a while construct. So, uh, just, you know, just like we have for loops in C++ and while loops, we have while loops in S as well. Uh, here, we just have something where uh, every iteration. The body, yeah, it's pretty the short. Construct it works the same as before. We're short on time. So. Okay, so overlap is a contract that it starts getting a little bit more interesting. So. By default, it defines a sequence that is followed sequentially. Overlap allows you to add a little bit more uncertainty and asynchrony in to the when blocks. Uh, so basically, or well, any S tag construct. So overlap can let you uh, adaptively overlap these blocks. So for example, here, uh, we know that we want to do block one first. And then we know that before we do this block five, we need to do blocks two, three, and four. But we don't care in which order we do them. So this overlap will say, okay, maybe entry method one is, or entry method two is here, but entry method one is not. But we're in an overlap block, so we can do this first. Then maybe we do the serial. Then we do this. We just do whatever work is available while still enforcing some kind of ordering. So we guarantee that block five does not execute before all its prerequisites have been met. Uh, just another example of an overlap where we can go down these two chains and interleave basically, and once they're both finished, that's what will be the end of the computation. Uh, for all is another kind of loop with do all semantics. Uh, it's basically a loop in which the iterations can occur in any order. 
So you know you want to do some computation this many times. Uh, you just don't care in which order each iteration happens. Um, there's a parallel prefix example in the in the tutorial code. We can probably just gloss over that. It's again, it's it allows you to pull up the for when you pass a value, all the whoops, control flow is just made explicit. So um, depending on what stage of the prefix you're in, you will send your value to your neighbor, and then you will wait for the appropriate value from your stage to arrive, increment your value, and then after you've gone through all the stages of the parallel prefix, you'll contribute to the done. And again, with this asynchrony, uh, for example, if you're near the end and you don't have as many stages, uh, to compute or to actually send values for, uh, you do this, and then when you get to contribute, that'll happen asynchronously. So you'll contribute that you're done, and while the other chars are not done, they can move along while you're just sitting there idle. And with over decompensation and asynchrony, that will all happen asynchronously. Those quotes around uh, like the there are different phases in the, the done and the send value. That's just Right, so, so this is, yeah, this is a tag, so like when we do the performance, for example, when we look at projections views, it will tell us like, oh, this is much time was spent in this entry method and this entry oh. method. Now we can break it up, you know, if we do serial, we want, might want to see, oh, how much time was taken in this serial block of code, and that will show up in your projections reports. Uh, da, 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 da. Again, iteration, this, this very clearly can lay out iterative codes using for loops and blocking in each iteration for the messages that you need. Um, yeah, I think we're just mapped this. Yeah, it is pretty much what we saw. You have the exchanges at each side, and in each loop, you wait for your exchange, and you compute the data, and then move on to the next iteration. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is, okay, okay, again, this is another example of STAG. Remember what, what was the what was this trying to show? The, what was the you big could point? set up a whole bunch of requests and then wait for the responses. Okay. Oh right. yes. Okay. So yeah. In this case, uh, you know your key is the value for the key is stored somewhere, so you send the message there, and then you just wait for those values to come back. You don't care where they're coming from. Uh, you just know that you sent out, for example, n requests, so you're expecting n responses, and as you get them, you'll you'll store them in your own local data. Um, okay. So I'll pick up here. Uh, so I've been informed that people have meetings potentially scheduled for Sunday, like starting at one. And the question was whether you wanted to like break and get lunch before that, or you know, and put this, or you know, Good get stuff after the right yeah, So uh, <laughs> yeah. the application design, you have put that section. Uh, you know about that section from uh, the group yesterday when you were with MD. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. And it's not quite the same, but in a given the time, it's probably better to skip that. So what I was thinking was, uh, first of all, we should order some sandwiches. So everyone knows Jimmy John's, uh, Jimmy John's number. <laughs> uh, you don't it's know what Jimmy yeah. John's is? No. Okay. Wrong part of the country, Sunday. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so sandwich. Sandwich. Is there a cafe downstairs? Yeah, there's a cafe downstairs, there's too. A cafe downstairs, but I think it will save time. We are, we are really pressed for time. We need Chris for at least a meeting uh, on, on our project. Mm -hmm. um, 2 o'clock will be the meeting uh, for you. There is our shift. Uh, Tom has been waiting since morning for, uh, for his meeting uh, with us. And so uh, we could uh, order sandwich, then go over. Someone else can show. Uh, how to use dynamic load balancing, and we can see. Yeah, I can do the dynamic load too. balancing. Uh, but as I is okay for people, yeah. then we can figure out what. Uh, okay, Turkey, raise your hand. Here, you know what? I can make I this really this, easy. Yeah. 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 Ah, crap. Uh, minimize. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Go. Yes. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. No, it doesn't matter what order we order the sandwich. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, very very secret. It's associated with the meeting. Yes. Really? Damn it. it where's the menu? Yeah. 
I just want the menu. There we go. There. Okay. Um, there we go. The giant menu. Yep, here we go. Reading subs on the left is the usual common thing. Which, oh, the subs on this side? Yeah, or you can do uh, one without any brand, which is the letter slap and the sub brand. Just, just write them on the whiteboard. Yeah, I'll, just, um, uh, I'll take a big jump, please. Uh, it's number two. Number two. Okay. Elsa? I'm on four. Okay. Four? Okay. Two. What do you like? I'm in the three. Uh, should we get for the rest of us too? Well, yeah. Well, yes, yes. yes. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, yes. Okay. Three. Uh, Oop. Sorry. Three. Two more. Three. Okay. Uh, yeah. Two, three, two, four. It's for me. Okay. We'll add us later. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I'll add a six on each. Okay. So just add six. Oh, you can do opposite. We can do opposite. Everyone done? Two, four, sixty-nine. Nine. Yes. Okay. okay. So three, three, So sandwiches, and then by the time they arrive, you will be done here. Yeah. By by fiat, like one o five. Sure. And then you can do the rest. Of and the they will, in fact, be here that quickly, which is their selling point. Yeah, well, um, hmm. Impressive. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. No. The, okay. So yeah, we're gonna skip application design then. Did you want to take? Are you gonna do the performance tuning stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, Shina, what are they doing? Yeah. Lunch? Where? Um, uh, probably near lunch. That's what they decided. Okay. Should I go with them? You think? Mom is quite yeah. unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um. So uh. Okay. I need to call you guys. Okay. <laughs> Cosmology. Uh, yeah, it's sound guy. Yeah, it's sound guy. Yeah, it's sound guy. Yeah, power. And I'll move this one. Oh, Daryl. I just don't know. I actually don't know. I don't know. Hack. Okay. Well, it's not. You can't jump. Then I, that's not going. Yeah. You can't just go to the hack website. Oh, no, you need to mirror your display. <laughs> yeah. That's one difference. Yeah. Okay. Wait. So something yeah. tells me there's some special sauce in there that they don't. I mean, I'm sure the bits of science code that they implement vary also. Yeah. But, but I'm just looking at the science presentation, the same parts I can we're looking at the same huge volume space, but they're a model of dark matter. Yeah, and I'm not sure. They're going to. They're going to. They're going to. Right, it looks like it's disappeared on the Yeah, they're underlying. I mean, I think when I unplugged it, it just dropped me. So, I don't know. Which is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, you know, what Hardship presents is going to be the end. So. OK, yeah. Let me check out my laptop. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. So the performance analysis up. and uh, dynamic load balancing, and that would be the end. I have to share the screen, right? Uh, or no need? Yeah. 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 We do still have someone watching. We think maybe. Let's do it anyway. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Here's your mic. Yeah, that's a big difference. So, about performance tuning using projections. Projections is a way to do that used by many of the applications to figure out what is wrong with a, a scaling event. So, you find that after 8 or 16K, or even 128K4, you find that there is some problem with the scaling, and we, we can get all the logs about individual communication, et cetera, using projections tool. So it's very easy to enable it. You just have to say slash trace mode projections, and the runtime system will 
uh, instrument, every message, uh, every message to a chart, and it's turned up into a log chart, which is called the case, and we will have one log chart. And then you can use, uh, download the projection tools to, and start with the projection clients with log chart. So I'll briefly, I'll quickly try to show how to start the projections. Um, so that's probably difficult. So basically, I, I'll say the projections uh, is the tool name, the binary.